now a House hearing on the safety of the drug Avandia, which is used to treat type 2 diabetes. A recent New England Journal of Medicine study showed the drug had a 43% increased risk of heart attack. The drug's manufacturer disputes the findings. This is four hours. The meeting of the uh, committee will come to order. Today we are holding a hearing about an important medication that is being used by a million Americans to control their diabetes. Diabetes is a terrible disease. Diabetics are unable to control their blood sugar. High blood sugar affects nearly every part of the body and can cause blindness, kidney failure, heart attack and stroke. Heart attacks and stroke caused by high blood sugar levels end up killing two out of three, uh, uh, two out of every three diabetics. Diabetes can't be cured, but with proper medical attention and effective drugs, it can be controlled and the devastating consequences of diabetes can be delayed or even prevented. Endocrinologists who specialize in the tr treatment of diabetes believe that drugs that lower blood sugar levels are especially important to prevent the long-term complications of, these disease, of this disease. Avandia was approved in 1999 because of clinical evidence that it effectively lowers the blood sugar levels in diabetics. Trials conducted since then confirm that Avandia is indeed effective in lower blo lowering blood sugar levels. That's why it has been so widely prescribed by doctors across the nation. Avandia, however, is a sophisticated and complicated drug. It works at the gene level and it has multiple effects on the body. For instance, it may increase weight and cholesterol. That's why from the outset concerns have been raised about whether Avandia could increase the risk of heart attacks. I have struggled with the right tone for today's hearings. To diabetes is a serious illness and Avandia is an effective medication for lowering blood sugar. Sounding a false alarm about the dangers of the drug has the potential to cause serious harm to patients. On the other hand, there have been repeated warnings from the day of approval forward about the potential cardiac risks associated with Avandia, and these should not be ignored. It is not Congress's role to adjudicate these medical issues, but it is our role to ensure, ensure that the Federal Food, and, uh, Federal Food and Drug Administration is taking these concerns seriously and providing doctors and patients with the guidance they need to make informed decisions. And that's why we're holding this hearing today. Although Avandia has been marketed for eight years and has been used by millions of Americans, the post-market studies have not been done to say conclusively whether Avandia increases or decreases the risk of heart attacks. That's a major failure of our system. And, it is what it, and that is what is causing so much confusion and worry among the patients who are taking Avandia today. Avandia was approved on May 25, 1999. The primary medical reviewer at FDA recommended approval of the drug because clinical trials showed it to be effective at reducing blood sugar. That was justified and appropriate. The medical reviewer also noticed that the clinical data raised questions about Avandia's effect on the heart. And I'd like to introduce the findings of the medical reviewer into the record and read an excerpt. The excerpt is technical and long, but it reveals how our system is supposed to work. And the quote I want to read is, whether Avandia favorably affects the natural history of type 2 diabetes is open to question. Long-term improvement in HbA1c, a measure of blood sugar, should decrease the risk of retinopathy, eye problems, nephropathy, kidney problems, and neuropathy, nerve problems. 
However, the increase in body weight and undesirable effects on serum lipids, cholesterol, is cause for concern. Heart disease due to atherosclerosis is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in patients with type 2 diabetes, and it cannot be assumed that treatment with Avandia will decrease the risk. Well, because of this concern about the potential for deleterious long-term effects on the heart, the medical reviewer recommended that a post-marketing study to address these concerns needs to be a condition of approval. The medical reviewer did everything right. He recognized that Avandia held great promise because of its impact on blood sugars, and he recognized there were questions about its side effects that could be answered conclusively only through a properly designed post-market trial. Unfortunately, at that point, FDA dropped the ball. FDA and the drug manufacturer did agree on a post-market study called ADOPT, but it was designed to show whether Avandia provided long-term control of blood sugar levels, not to assess whether Avandia increases the risk of heart attacks. ADOPT did show that Avandia is an excellent drug for keeping blood sugar, uh, sugar under control, but it did not answer the medical reviewer's questions about heart risks. FDA did receive several warnings about a potential link between Avandia and heart attacks. In March 2000, Dr. John Buse, who will testify on the second panel today, wrote FDA to request cardiovascular safety trials in high-risk populations. In February 2003, with the World Health Organization issued a warning of the potential cardiac risks associated with drugs like Avandia. A year later, a review in the New England Journal of Medicine stated that, quote, data about the effects of TZDs, drugs like Avandia, on cardiovascular disease are urgently needed. Then in October 2005, the drug manufacturers Factorer GlaxoSmithKline informed FDA that an internal company analysis showed that Avandia may be associated with increased risk of myocardial ischemia, a medical term that includes heart attacks. The drug manufacturer gave the FDA this analysis 11 months later, along with a second study the company sponsored that did not show increased risk. Yet despite the FDA medical reviewer's recommendation, despite additional warnings by outside experts, despite the millions of patients who rely on Avandia to control their blood sugar, and despite the potential risks involved, FDA never required the manufacturer to study a thorough post-market study of Avandia's heart risks. In fact, it took the publication of an article last month in the New England Journal of Medicine to spur the agency to public action. European regulars, regulators were not so negligent. Over six years ago, they required GlaxoSmithKline to initiate a study called RECORD, which is designed to assess cardiovascular risks. The company published partial results from this study yesterday. Unfortunately, as we will hear from the experts on our second panel, the results to date are inconclusive and record does not appear to be large enough to answer the key questions about Avandia's cardiac risks. It was not designed to be completed until 2009. Well, many people watching this hearing today will be looking for answers about whether Avandia is safe, and I understand and share their desire for answers, but because of the lack of data, they, there may be no de definitive conclusions. By examining Avandia, however, we can learn a lot about the drug approval and post-market surveillance process. Avandia is a case study of the need for reform of our drug safety laws. As a member of Congress, I'm not qualified to judge whether the risks of Avandia outweigh its benefits, but I do know that the millions of diabetics who have taken Avandia have not been well served by our regulatory system. Doctors and their patients should be able to turn to FDA for guidance about the safety of the drugs they take. But in the case of Avandia, 
FDA did not insist upon the data it needs to consider their questions definitively. Legislation has passed the Senate and is pending in the House that would give FDA new powers to require post-market studies of drugs like Avandia. This hearing will show why these reforms are urgently needed. FDA needs the will, the resources, and the authority to be a more effective watchdog of drug safety. And I look forward to the testimony we will receive, and I want to thank all of the witnesses for being here today. I want to now uh, call on uh, the ranking uh, Republican member of the committee, Mr. Davis, for his opening statement. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. <clears throat> Once again, this committee meets to consider serious questions about how the Food and Drug Administration and drug makers monitor the long-term safety of approved pharmaceutical products. In 2004 and 2005, we led ex an extensive bipartisan investigation into the pain reliever Vioxx, confronting many of the same questions we face today. How effective are programs by the FDA and industry to gather timely and useful data on lingering safety concerns about approved products? When those safety concerns emerge, how should preliminary, often anecdotal information be used by regulators, clinicians, and patients? And how do we strike the correct balance between speedy approval of life-saving or life-enhancing therapies that patients want and the much slower process of amassing statistically valid data set on long-term health outcomes? Today's hearing was prompted by recent warnings the diabetes medication Avandia, manufactured by GlaxoSmithKline, may increase the risk of cardiovascular disease in some patients, patients already uniquely vulnerable to heart problems. An admittedly limited meta-analysis of disparate research findings suggests that increase may be substantial, but other studies point to little, if any, measurable increase in heart risk. So patients and doctors are left with conflicting or incomplete information upon uh, which to base delicate judgments about the net benefits of various treatment options. But this hearing, as the Chairman notes, is not about one product. At least it shouldn't be. It is about the effectiveness of the overall drug approval and the monitoring process. As the Chairman's memo to members cautioned, this hearing is not about whether Avandia makes patients healthier or harms them. We are not here to substitute our judgment for that of scientists and regulators still evaluating clinical safety data. But we are here to ask whether current post-marketing surveillance programs and protocols are both robust and sensitive enough to detect emerging evidence of deleterious health effects and how that evidence informs regulatory, research and treatment decisions. Taken by almost 1 million Americans today, Avandia was approved in 1999 because it lowers harmful blood sugar levels in patients suffering type 2 diabetes. Managing type 2 diabetes by lowering blood sugar can decrease the patient's chance of having diabetes-related problems later in life, such as kidney failure, heart disease, stroke and limb amputation. But the so-called surrogate endpoint of reduced blood glucose is only an indirect measure of the drug's overall impact on health. And questions about the extent of any increased cardiovascular risk posed by Avandia were raised eight years ago. So the FDA required Glaxo to compare the safety and effectiveness of Avandia with other oral antidiabetes medic medicines. In 2000, the company initiated another large long-term clinical trial to look specifically at cardiovascular outcomes in people with diabetes using Avandia to manage the disease. So far, results from that study have not shown increased health risks at levels suggested by the meta-analysis that would require discontinuation of the research for safety reasons. Nevertheless, last year, based on data from a study involving patients with existing uh, congestive heart failure, the FDA required a labeling change for the drug to include a new warning about a potential increase in heart attacks and heart-related chest pain in some individuals. The FDA will convene an advisory committee as early as next month to review this matter. That committee's findings should provide health care providers and patients with a better understanding of any cardiovascular risks involved with the use of Avandia. It is not clear if the advisory committee will also look at the entire class of oral antidiabetes medications that operate like Avandia. Perhaps FDA can answer that question today. This muddled post-marketing picture is not unique. A recent New England Journal of Medicine editorial called the FDA approach to post-approval or phase four research desultory because during the period from 1998 through 2003, only about a quarter of the required Phase IV trials were completed, and as of September 30, 2006, a total of 899 Phase IV studies remain pending. 
As a result, the safety profile of some drugs, particularly those approved using surrogate endpoints, can remain incomplete for years. Most Americans believe once the FDA approves a drug, it carries the medical equivalent of the good housekeeping seal of approval and can be used with little or no risk. But the process of developing, marketing, regulating, prescribing, and using modern pharmaceuticals involves some, at times considerable, risk at every stage. Those risks have to be acknowledged frankly and managed responsibly. Adverse event surveillance and research have to be sensitive enough to detect potential safety problems, but discreet enough to distinguish between well-publicized anecdotes and scientific evidence. Otherwise, public confidence in both the FDA and the pharmaceutical industry will be undermined by conflicting data and allegations no one is protecting the long-term welfare of patients. I look forward to hearing from our panels of expert witnesses today on how we can strengthen FDA drug approval and post-marketing surveillance systems. I would ask unanimous consent that the statement of Dr. Brian Strom, the Chairman of Biostatistics and Epidemiology and Director of the Center for Clinical Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Pennsylvania be included in the official hearing record. Without objection, that will be the order. Thank you. Uh, we have a number of witnesses uh, to uh, present uh, testimony to us today, and so we did not invite the members to give opening statements. Of course, all of the members' opening statements that they wish to submit will be made a part of the record, but we do have a request from Congressman Towns, and I do want to recognize him, and in doing so, uh, I, I will invite any other member who wants to make a very brief statement to uh, do so. so um, uh, but to recognize the fact that we'll, we'll keep it uh, brief, and uh, and you may uh, submit a, a full a fuller statement for the record, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for calling uh, this hearing uh, on patient safety. As you know, diabetes and heart disease occur in the African American population at a rate disproportionate to the general population. That is also true of Hispanic Americans. Death rates for strokes are about 25 percent higher for African-American males and about 20 percent higher for African-American women. African-Americans develop high blood pressure at an early age and heart disease death rates are 1.5 times higher and 1.8 times, times greater for fatal strokes. Yet despite their disproportionate higher mortality and morbidity, of cardiovascular disease, Latinos and African Americans are significantly less likely than whites to undergo treatment for their conditions and less likely to receive the most advanced cardiac uh, procedures. Despite having the same insurance status and disease severity rates, diabetes rates are also significantly higher for African Americans and Hispanic Americans. These are also not one at a time conditions. If you have one, there is a greater likelihood that you may have them together. The published higher death rates from the May the 16th New England Journal of Medicine study are, of course, what brings us here today. However, Mr. Chairman, while I am certainly concerned about the possibility of uh, uh, or the potential higher level of risk for cardiovascular causes that have been associated in this single study of, of Vendia, I am more concerned with the likelihood of the low levels of participation of African Americans and other people of color in the clinical trials associated with uh, Vendia. I am certainly aware of the large number of clinical trials associated with, however, I am particularly concerned that their findings have not have sufficient data to make a determination as to the effects of this drug on African Americans and Hispanics, whether they associate uh, Amadea with higher levels of risk for death from cardiovascular causes or not. While we are not here today, Mr. Chairman, to discuss the reauthorization of the Prescription Drug User Free Act, a number of us serve on the Committee on Oversight and the Committee on Energy and Commerce, as you and I do. I am here today to make sure that both the Food and Drug Administration and the pharmaceutical and medical devices industry take the expansion of the numbers of African Americans and Hispanic Americans in drug and medical devices studies seriously. I am therefore proposing in the Paducah reauthorization a more verifiable alternative for minorities than the pediatric exclusion and an Office of Diverse Population within the Office of the FDA Commissioner that will have the authority and responsibility 
of increasing the numbers of racially and ethnically diverse populations within the FDA. Mr. Chairman, I believe that we need to get to the bottom of whether or not there is associated risk with NVIDIA. However, that risk should have scientific evidence that applies to ethnically and racially diverse communities, as well as the general population. And I would like to um, submit a statement for the record from the National Medical Association, which actually supports the, the statement that I just made. So I would like to uh, uh, submit that for the record as well. Without objection. And on that, that note, I yield added. back, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for the special consideration. Thank you, Mr. Towns. Any other member wish to make an opening statement? Mr. Issa? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will be brief and put my entire statement in for the record. But I think it is important. Uh, First of all, I would like to thank you for your opening statement. I think that it, uh, it helped balance perhaps what started off very much as imbalance in this hearing. I am concerned today that we, we not tread too closely toward the hypocrisy that I believe this hearing begins to look like. Uh, just a few months ago, this committee held a hearing in which the Bush administration was accused of politicizing science, of censoring and editing research. Uh, and politicizing science, science is exactly what we could be doing here today. This is not global warming. This is, in fact, though, an ongoing investigation on a current drug early in the questioning period. I believe that the anecdotal evidence that uh, came out from the uh, New England Journal of Medicine, which we now understand in included some consulting to the majority members of this committee, is, in fact, a very dangerous pattern. A few weeks ago, New England Journal of Medicine questioned something. We now hold a hearing on that drug and uh, consistent with that drug. As the Chairman said rightfully, and I appreciate his saying it, none of us here is qualified to evaluate this drug. As a matter of fact, none of the people speaking before us today without a vast group of people not present is capable of evaluating the safety and, and side effects of this drug. <laughs> It is, in fact, the FDA and science's community responsibility to get all the research in and, in fact, then to go through that as a panel, not as one individual speaking before this committee. I appreciate that this is the committee of oversight and of reform. If we are doing oversight, I believe that it is okay to look at something if it is a clear and present danger. That is not the case here. This drug is very much still effective and on the market for patients today and should not be artificially called into question as to its safetyness, safety or, or side effects as a result of anecdotal information presented here. Viox, Celebrex and other drugs certainly have gone through a much more exhaustive study and could be just as easily used to show the need for reform and, in fact, as an oversight agency to, uh, to look at past failures. I believe that we have to we are treading very close to exactly the hypocrisy that this committee can easily be drawn into, politicizing science while saying that we don't want to politicize science. So I appreciate the Chairman's opening remarks. Hopefully that has set uh, a tenor for not only what is being said by uh, the witnesses today, but in fact for our questions, that we not allow this to be about uh, one drug or one uh, limited study and that we try to stay toward the settled science, toward the settled cases of the FDA in our oversight and potential reforms. And I thank the Chairman for his opening statement because hopefully it brought us a little closer to, and the Ranking Member, a little closer toward the correct reason for this committee to hold these types of hearings. And I yield back and thank the Chairman. Uh, Mr. Issa, I am uh, pleased you attacked the hypocrisy that you admitted did not exist. I don't know if the New England Journal of Medicine would resent being categorized as a, 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 a magazine that simply puts together a bunch of anecdotes, but I certainly resent the statement that there was any kind of consultation between the people that wrote the article, the New England Journal of Medicine and the majority of this committee. It is just absolutely not true. Well, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the author of the study published in the New England Journal of Medicine admitted to the Wall Street Journal that he had talked to people on the Hill while preparing his analysis, yet the F FDA says that no one was, has consulted them. So, in fact, I believe that this is dangerously close to that question of politicizing science. Uh, and it, like I say, I, I appreciate the fact that your opening statement was balanced, but we have to look at the underlying premise of bringing a hearing on a drug three weeks after 
a, uh, an article comes out and the author of that article admits that he's been talking to people on the Hill, this is one of those times in which I want to make sure that this is not an attack on the practice of, of, the, uh, of a particular company, but rather, or a chilling effect on companies, but rather legitimate oversight and legitimate effort to find reform. And I appreciate the Chairman's uh, effort to try to lead it that direction. I wanted to make sure that I uh, supported him in pushing this hearing in that correct direction. Thank you, uh, I thank you for your uh, explanation of your conclusion, and it will stand uh, for all to review, and I appreciate your statements. Any other member wish to make an opening Mr. statement? Chairman. Yes, Mr. Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do not have a written statement, but I do want to, as a member of the committee, thank you for calling the hearing, and also as a person who has been diagnosed as a type 2 diabetic. I, I want to emphasize the particular personal interest that I have in, in this hearing. And I agree with your, your, the conclusion in your opening statement that I hope that we will move towards, and we do in fact need, a stronger and more resourceful Food and Drug Administration so that they have not only the authority but also the resources that are needed to do extensive research and oversight to try and assure that the pharm pharmaceutical drugs that we use for medical treatment are as safe as humanly possible. So again, I thank you for calling the hearing and look forward to hearing the witnesses. Thank you very much, Mr. Davis. Uh, any other member wish to make a very brief statement, Ms. Fox? Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. Um, my background is as a social scientist, and I worked for many years in medical research. So in reading the material about um, today's hearing, I uh, tried to bring back some of my experiences of some time ago. And I wanted to get a definition of the term meta-analysis, and I think that it's really important that in this hearing we keep in mind what a meta-analysis is. Uh, the purpose of it is to raise questions but not to draw a conclusion. And let me read you a definition from Tabor's Cyclopedic Medical Dictionary. It says, meta-analysis, a statistical procedure for combining data from a number of studies and investigations in order to analyze the therapeutic effectiveness of specific treatments, and this is the really important part, and plan future studies. Um, the meta-analysis does not actually do research. It does not gather the data that is so important to gather when uh, drug companies are searching for the effectiveness of the drugs they're working with. And so I think it's extremely important that we keep in mind what a meta-analysis is. Now, Mr. Chairman, um, on May 21st, Dr. Nissen's study was published by the New England Journal of Medicine along with the journal editorial encouraging physicians to stop prescribing the drug and encouraging the FDA to take regulatory action. Then there were alarming headlines pronouncing an increased risk of death for anyone taking this drug. According to a very interesting article entitled Political Defibrillator published in the May 28, 2000 issue of BioCentury, a journal providing analysis for the biotechnical community soon after the release of Dr. Nissen's study, uh, some of my congressional colleagues in the House and Senate issued statements to the press suggesting that they knew ahead of time about this study. Included among the press releases, there was an apparent attempt to manufacture a scandal, including the statement that, quote, both the drug company and the FDA have some major explaining to do about what they knew about Avandia, when they knew it, and why they didn't take immediate action to protect patients, end quote. These statements were made with disregard for the limits of this study and the impact that these statements and actions could have on public safety or the reputation of the company involved. Now let me read the opening paragraph of the BioCentury piece. 
The circumstances surrounding the publication by the New England Journal of Medicine of a meta-analysis of safety data from studies of Avandia and an accompanying commentary suggesting that FDA critics on Capitol Hill have collaborated with whistleblowers in the agency and pharmaceutical industry critics in academia to create a controversy over Avandia's safety in order to advance a political agenda. According to this article, even though members of the Senate and House and their staffs were apparently aware of the study and that it was going to be published, the author never notified the FDA. Yet the FDA is the one agency that holds the key to action if this study, in fact, revealed data about an immediate threat to the public. The British medical journal, The Lancet, published May 23, 2007, took issue with how this was handled, stating that, quote, to avoid unnecessary panic among patients, a calmer and more considered approach to the safety of rosagilitazone is needed. Alarmist headlines and confident declarations help nobody, end quote. Mr. Chairman, while there is no need to manufacture a scandal here, it appears that there may already be one that needs investigating, at least by the press. I'd like to see the press determine what members of Congress and their staff knew about this study, when they knew it, and whether there was a coordinated effort among the author, disgruntled FDA staff, and staff at the New England Journal of Medicine to develop and publish this study in a way that would create a sensation in the press and maximum embarrassment for the FDA. I, I, my husband is diabetic, and so I'm very interested in this disease and very interested in our finding treatments for it. It is a very pernicious disease and one of the most expensive in our country. However, we serve no purpose by scaring people about drugs. And I have no dog in this fight, as they say. I am not here as an apologist for Glaxo. Uh, but I think we should be very careful when we talk about scientific issues and make sure that we have a balanced approach yeah. to this. Thank you, Mr. General Chairman. General, time is, uh, is concluded. I would like to get to the witnesses. Does any member feel compelled to say anything further? Yes. Gentleman from Massachusetts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I will be brief. I, I just want to address a couple of things. First of all, there has been the uh, allegation that this, this uh, study was anecdotal. And I just want to point to the, uh, to the editorial itself and uh, uh, the reports and the concerns uh, that have been cited by the doctors. They were based on uh, 40 different studies, and I think they are very thoughtful. Uh, secondly, you know, I, I agree with the sentiment, although I, I'm not so sure it's shared, that this shouldn't be uh, dragged down into some type of partisan politics issue. Uh, however, I think when you begin the hearing by, by criticizing the New England Journal of Medicine because of uh, something that's been published there, which is, uh, I think, a very thoughtful view. It's just one view, but a very thoughtful. But to impugn their character that is somehow in league uh, politically to to uh, take down a, a drug company, I, I think you, you, you immediately drag down the debate to that level, and I, I would just caution against it. Uh, you know, the second uh, just comment I want to address is the idea that somehow uh, folks that come to the oversight committee because of an issue of genuine concern uh, have done so for political purposes and not for legitimate reasons uh, has not been proven here has not, and should not be suggested. And this is where people should come. It should not be, it should not be uh, circumstantial evidence to the disingenuousness of, of people who come to this committee that they have come to us with an issue. This is the oversight committee. This is where they should be coming. And, and we should have the intelligence and, and, and the balance here to just let let the evidence be presented and not suggest that it's being done for a disingenuous reason and, and then have it presented in that, that context. This is a tremendously important issue. Thank the gentleman. You know, my, my family has diabetes. I know thousands and thousands of families that are dealing with this problem. We should approach this as adults. And in the end of the day, it may, it may prove that the, that the concern was elevated. It may prove that the concern was understated, if the but we should receive the evidence in, in an open and, and, and honest discussion. That is the way we should, 
should have it. And uh, I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired. We'll now go to our uh, witnesses. Uh, we have with us the uh, head Chairman. of the uh, F. Can I make a brief statement? The gentleman's recognized for a brief statement. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, it, it appears to me in, in uh, hearing the opening statements and uh, kind of thinking through this that the real concern is that there may be a side effect from this drug. And we don't know if that side effect is present based on this meta study that it may be a side <laughs> effect. Um, I also understand that according to the FDA, no approved diabetes drug has ever shown any kind of reduction in, in macrovascular risk, the kinds of risk that may exist here today. So I, I guess in the testimony, I'm, I'm hoping that it becomes clear, number one, whether we can really say that the side effect does exist from this drug. And if it doesn't, then I think our uh, job of oversight may be done at that point. But secondly, even if it does exist, uh, does it exist in such a uh, significant number of cases that we know about that we can say the FDA is off track and this committee with its oversight capability should intervene? And finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, I think the question is, knowing that there's a side effect, is it appropriate uh, uh, for doctors to prescribe it anyway? There are plenty of drugs who have, that have known side effects. If patients are better off if this drug is prescribed, perhaps it will change prescribing patterns for uh, physicians that are involved. But if there's a known side effect, if everybody <coughs> takes that into account in making the decision whether to take the drug, prescribe the drug, are the people better off uh, who can take this uh, drug by prescription? And if they are, again, this committee has no business in uh, providing oversight. Well, perhaps we can get some answers to those questions from the scientists. I'd like to uh, welcome uh, our first uh, witnesses. Dr. Von Eschenbach is the uh, current commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. He's the former head of the National Cancer Institute and is a renowned uh, cancer specialist. We're delighted to have you uh, here to testify. Accompanying uh, Dr. Von Eschenbach is Dr. Dahl Pan, who's the head of the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology at the Food and Drug Administration. And uh, Dr. Jenkins is the head of the Office of New Drugs at FDA. We want to welcome each of you to our hearing today. Uh, we, we're looking forward to uh, your views on some of these uh, scientific and regulatory questions that uh, members have on their minds. Uh, it is the practice of this committee to ask all witnesses to uh, take a, an oath, and I'd like to ask you to rise. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give will be the, uh, uh, before this committee, will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you very much. The record will indicate that uh, each of the witnesses acted, a answered in the <coughs> affirmative. And Dr. Von Eschenbach, why don't we start with you? Um, we ordinarily ask um, uh, witnesses to be limited to five minutes in their oral presentation. Your full statement will be part of the record. We'll run the clock. Uh, if you need a little bit more time, uh, I, I we'll certainly uh, provide it to you. Thank you. And there's a button on the base of the mic, and be sure to have it close enough to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Davis and members of the committee. I, I really want to express our appreciation for allowing us to appear before you today. My written testimony provides important details about the scientific facts and many post-marketing trials that are involved in FDA's ongoing multifaceted regulation of the diabetes drug rosiglitazone, perhaps better known as Avandia. Rather than recount those details, I would like to focus my oral statement on the process used at FDA to do the right thing for patients by making decisions using a comprehensive multidisciplinary approach that incorporates all the data available and addresses the best interest of all patients affected by that decision. With me are two senior and expert FDA colleagues, Dr. John Jenkins, the director of the Office of New Drugs, and Dr. Gerald Delpan, the director of the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology, formerly 
the Office of Drug Safety. Both of these offices are part of FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, and their presence this morning is important regarding the FDA's decision-making process because they represent the close interaction between the FDA office that reviews marketing applications for new drugs and the office that monitors their safety profile. We're here as partners, reflecting the management and the professionals at the FDA who are dedicated to collaborating even more closely, not simply to approve products, disapprove them, or defer decisions, but rather to do the right thing so that our actions will both promote and protect the health of Americans. Mr. Chairman, I know that you called this hearing because of your deep concern for the welfare of Americans, a motivation that transcends politics and that is shared by every member of this committee. And I know you and members of Congress want and even demand that the FDA do its utmost to protect and promote the health of all Americans including those millions of Americans affected by diabetes and the hundreds of thousands that are perhaps using the drug Avandia. Let me be clear at the outset. Our focus in the decisions FDA has, has made and will make on Avandia is to serve that approximate 18 to 20 million Americans who are at risk of blindness, kidney failure, limb amputation, and death from diabetes. We will carry out that mission by thoughtfully weighing the potential effect of FDA's actions on the entire patient and on all patients. It is our goal to not just make the right decision about a drug like Avandia, but more importantly, to always do the right thing for patients. How do we do the right thing? First, by doing it as a team that embraces the diversity of all points of view and weighs all points of view to arrive at an FDA decision. Second, by using decision standards that are science-based, drawing upon all the scientific data that bears on an issue, and by demanding of ourselves and others rigor, precision, and accuracy in the analysis of that data, because our decision that weighs both the benefits and the risks of a drug will affect not one or a few, but often millions of lives. Third, by committing to a standard of excellence that requires us to constantly improve the processes by which we make decisions. Since I arrived at FDA, we have specifically addressed process improvement as it relates to decisions regarding drug safety. We've completed or are rapidly putting in place more than 40 drug safety initiatives that are in keeping with the recommendations of the Institute of Medicine report that we commission. A few recent examples of process improvement are the fact that we've issued a guidance on communicating drug safety information, announced the creation of a risk communications advisory committee, proposed tougher procedures for membership on FDA advisory committees, and our critical path initiative promises to provide the modern tools needed to improve the predictability of the processes by which products are discovered developed and monitored after delivery to patients. We have acknowledged that increasing demands and the complexity of the products we regulate requires increasing resources. And we are grateful for the administration's proposals and the congressional consideration given to the additional resources in fiscal year 2007 and those being considered for 2008. Among the many needs, we must especially use these resources to build a more robust FDA infrastructure of information technology to obtain and analyze all the data required for timely and accurate decisions. We need to focus on product safety throughout the entire life cycle of the product, including stronger post-market surveillance and pharmacovigilance. In fact, a robust pharmacovigilance system supported through a public-private arrangement such as an institute or a foundation, could provide considerable benefit and would be most welcome as part of the congressional consideration of pending FDA legislation. Closing, Mr. Chairman, let me emphasize that as we deal with drug safety, we encourage those with an interest to bring to us comments, ideas, and data from all sources. 
FDA is committed to appropriate scientific dialogue and discussion about the making of decisions. And in the end, we must always be true to our mission to both protect and promote the health of all Americans. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for your time, your interest, and your commitment to this mission. And my colleagues and I would be pleased now to answer any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Van Eschenbach. We're going to start with uh, 10 minutes uh, on each side. I want to um, I want to thank you very much for your testimony. You're a very distinguished uh, scientist, and uh, I know that you have a um, your a, a job at FDA that you're uh, trying to see through in a in relying on good science and recognizing the public interest. And of course, I've been a strong supporter of the FDA because I think the American public expects the FDA to make sure that drugs that are available to them are safe and effective, not just at the time they're approved, but throughout the time the drug is available and, and going to be used. And that information is to be based on science, not rumors, not anecdotes, not demagoguery, but science. The issue with Avandia, like so many other drugs, is that it was approved without the full knowledge of all the impacts it might have. This is not unusual because many drugs need to be watched carefully after they're approved. But there's been a pressure at FDA to get drugs approved as quickly as possible. In fact, we even have user fees to help FDA have more resources to get those drugs approved. The question that I'm looking at is the post-marketing surveillance of this drug as it reflects post-marketing surveillance of other drugs. This particular drug was approved in, um, in 1999, and your reviewer at the FDA did, as I mentioned in my opening statements, exactly what he should do. He looked at the effectiveness, whether it lowers blood sugar, and he found that there was enough clinical evidence to show that it did. But he was concerned about the possibility of increased uh, heart attacks, strokes, uh, because of some evidence that he saw in the data and suggested that there be a post-marketing surveillance of that issue. And so that in um, 1999, we had uh, this, this uh, opportunity for FDA to make sure that the post-marketing study was being done. But it wasn't done. And then later in 2000, in 2003, you mentioned in your statement you welcomed the input from those who have concerns. Well, FDA got input from people who had concerns. Uh, Dr. Busey wrote to FDA to express his concern about Avandia's potential cardiovascular risks, and he urged the FDA to conduct a cardiovascular safety trial in high-risk populations. And still nothing was done. In February 2003, the World Health Organization issued a warning of potential cardiac risks associated with Avandia's class of drugs. And this was another opportunity for FDA to insist that a post-market study be done by the manufacturer on this potential danger. And nothing was done. And not until we got this report in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine has there been this great concern expressed in the public, which I must say to you, I had nothing to do with nor did any member of my staff have anything to do with, nor would the distinguished journal um, welcome us to, to get involved in their scientific evaluations. So there are a number of missed opportunities. What happened? Why didn't FDA insist on the post-marketing surveillance to look at the risk uh, for heart attacks and strokes? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First of all, I would like to, to echo your um, important emphasis on the fact that we are, in fact, looking at these issues from the point of view of the total life cycle of the product. We're building in much more opportunity to assure the safety of these drugs even before they're uh, allowed to be applied to patients in the general population. And we're doing that in the most efficient and effective way we can so that it is more rapid so that we can get these life-saving and life-enhancing drugs to people. But that rapidity does not mean it's reckless. We're applying the rigor and precision and discipline in the internal processes and also recognizing, as you pointed out, that once that drug goes out into a much larger population, no clinical study or trial 
could ever give us all the information we need. So we are engaged in rigorous post-market surveillance. With regard to this drug, there were post-marketing studies being conducted. FDA continued to be engaged in acquiring, analyzing, and assessing data coming in with regard to the experience that was being developed with Avandi in these large populations, both here and in Europe, and did, in fact, take regulatory action. And I'd like to ask Dr. Well, before Jenkins, you talk about the regulatory action, did, did, did you ask for and did you get a study on the potential side effects effect, uh, dealing with the heart, as was recommended by so many others that I mentioned? Did you actually tell the, 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 um, the manufacturer to do the study so you could have a definitive study? I'm going to let Dr. Jenkins talk about the approval and what was involved, and Dr. Delpan described the post-market assessment. Well, I'm more interested in the post-market. Because the so approval the seemed to be reasonable. No, the you saw enough approved. evidence. Your reviewer saw uh, the studies, right. said this drug is, is merits approval from what we've seen so far, uh, but raised the concern about the possible heart attack problem. Right. And he recommended that there be a follow up post market review. Dr. Pan, why wasn't one done? Uh, which, which, the which conditions of approval, Dr. Pan? Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me try to address that point. Uh, I was the senior member of the review team that reviewed Avandia back in 1999. I actually signed the approval letter for Avandia in 1999. And the approval did have a phase four commitment for a long-term four-year safety and efficacy study titled ADOPT, which was designed to look at the long-term efficacy of the drug, but also long-term safety, and specifically reading from our post-marketing commitment website, we talked about long-term safety, including hepatic effects, cardiovascular and hematologic effects, changes in body weight, and serum lipids. So the medical officer that you're describing, who in his review called for the study, this is the same study that he was calling for that we actually got as a post-marketing commitment. Did, did the study, uh, the ADOPT study, look at the uh, specific concerns about potential heart attack? I know you requested it. But in my understanding, the ADOPT study uh, only confirmed right. that the drug was effective in lowering blood sugar. At the time we approved Avandia, there were quite a number of different questions we had that we were looking for answers for. One of them was about its long-term efficacy in comparison to other drugs. There were concerns about its hepatic safety because uh, the previous member of this class had proven to have a liver toxicity signal. There were also concerns about congestive heart failure and edema. Did, did the study give you the answers you needed on the question of the, of the safety matters that uh, involved a larger population using the drug? Did, did, the did ADOPT give you the, do we have the answers from that study uh, that we can now cite as, um, as uh, uh, showing us on this specific issue of cardiac uh, problems that we now know the, the, the risks? The study was not specifically designed to be a study to evaluate myocardial infarction or heart attack in and of itself. It was designed to look at cardiovascular outcomes. We now have the data from that study. It was published last fall. It's currently under review by FDA. You're I think talking about ADOPT? ADOPT. It provides a lot of very valuable information about the cardiovascular safety of Avandi as well as its liver safety, its effectiveness in long-term use. So I think it was a very useful study. And when was that study concluded? The, I can't give you the exact date when it was concluded. It was published last fall and it was submitted to the FDA as a final study report earlier this year and it's currently under a complete review by FDA. Did it show that there were more heart attacks? The overall data did not seem to suggest that there was a difference between Avandia and metformin, another commonly used drug, or uh, a sulfonylurea. I think it was gliburide in that study. Okay, so you didn't have a any reason as a result of that study to think anything more needed to be done? We only got the final study report of ADOPT earlier this year. It's still under review. We have not completed our review of that study. The results I'm describing are what are in the published article from last fall. Now, the, uh, the company um, says that they have the study record. Now, they, they weren't told to do that study by the FDA, but by um, the Europeans. Right. And they cited some preliminary 
data from that study, which was specifically on the cardiac problems. Mm -hmm. and, and they said, well, that, this shows that this is not, a, not a, a, a problem. But some of the critics say, well, there wasn't a big enough um, population covered in that study. What, why, why did they do a second study if ADOPT resolved this issue? The record study was requested as a post-marketing commitment by the European regulatory agency when they approved the drug shortly after we did. Mm -hmm. So it was designed to address different questions. As I said, at the time of approval, there were multiple questions that could be answered by different studies. They chose to try to address a cardiovascular outcome study. Those data just recently became available and are under review at FDA. As you know, they were just published online in the New England Journal of Medicine yesterday. Okay. Well, my, my time is up, but I would submit to you, Dr. Jenkins that, uh, and Dr. Van Eschenbach, that the study ADOPT did not have a sample big enough, to, from what I understand, of the cardiac issues, and it was not conclusive on that question. Not, never, uh, even, uh, even accepting what you had to say, it took eight years before you got that study, and there had been enough uh, warning signs that this is a problem even before the New England Journal of Medicine article finally came out with their uh, report. Right. You had a number of instances where FDA's attention should have been to ask for a genuine study looking at this specific issue, because after all, heart attacks and strokes are one of the beating, leading causes of death with people with diabetes, and we want to know if this drug is reducing the risk or increasing the risk. Yes. Can and I that's, that's that? an issue that I don't think we fully resolved, or do you believe we've resolved? If I could respond to that. We did ask for a study to look at the long-term safety of Avandia, and we have the results of that study under review. The Europeans asked for a different study. We now have an interim analysis from that study. There were several different issues related to the cardiac effects of Avandia that were of interest in 1999 and 2000 when those studies were designed, including congestive heart failure. So you're probably correct that the record study doesn't look like it's going to be adequately powered for the endpoint of myocardial infarction or heart attack alone. That was not the primary concern in 2000 when the study was designed. So but there were others we, we do have very valuable concern. information coming to bear on this question. And just, uh, Dr. Penn, you, you reviewed this DOP study and the other studies post-market. Yeah, I mean, do you, right, the, the do you think we've concluded this issue as a result of this DOP study? I don't think we've come to a conclusion as a result of this or any study. I think we're still um, looking at all the data. We're looking at um, exactly how the study was designed, conducted, uh, picking apart the data, if you would. And we're also doing that for record. We're taking a careful look at how the study was designed, what it can and can't answer. Um, we only have data that's essentially what we have in the online publication from the New England Journal about record. We don't have the, the data sets or anything like that to, to look at it more thoroughly. But we are looking at the design and the in interim analysis results. Okay, thank you. Mr. Davis. Um, thank you. I want to thank you all for your time. There is controversy in the medical community about the use of surrogate endpoints because uh, drugs approved on this basis are not required to demonstrate actual clinical benefit. Is that correct? The, the expectation is that we look at a clinical endpoint that will reflect the favorable outcome of survival, the improvement but in the But we don't test for survival. Effects. We just look at the endpoint and as, assume the rest, Correct. basically. Some argue that the Avandia was approved on a, a surrogate endpoint, and while the drug is clearly efficacious, the health benefits haven't been demonstrated for exactly that reason. If you were to sit through uh, the whole process, it could take years to get any kind of approval. That's correct, but it was also approved in the context of the overall experience with diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, where it is recognized that control of blood sugar is an extremely important part of care, resulting then in the ability to reduce Understand. complications and problems that then would reduce the risk of right. death. And, and I guess um, my, my question is, what effect would abandoning a glycemic control as an endpoint have on the approval process for a diabetes drug? Well, the, the ability, if we were to eliminate that and go to a model that said we could not make a decision about a drug until we had absolute outcomes with regard to death, you would be looking at studies that would have to go on for decades, 20, per, 
25, 30 years perhaps before you get an answer. So if you went to that to get a diabetes drug approved, if the outcome trials were needed pre-approval, you're talking decades. There, there would literally be millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people dying in the interim until we got that answer. Okay. That's right. Some in the medical community have been critical in recent weeks that Dr. Nissen's uh, study was rushed to publication and created unnecessary confusion and concern among diabetics. How has the meta-analysis published in May in the New England Journal of Medicine contributed to our understanding of the balance of risks and benefits of Avandia? Well, we viewed the, the publication of this meta-analysis uh, along with all of the other uh, pieces and data of information that we had both from other meta-analyses as well as data and information from controlled clinical trials. And so we welcomed the additional contribution recognizing that like other meta-analyses, there are limitations of these kinds of studies. That's factored in obviously to the weight we apply to a meta-analysis, but the important point is it was one piece of information in a large portfolio of data and information that we, the FDA, have available to us upon which to make ultimate decisions about I mean, the right in, thing. In fact, the editorial itself notes um, the study has a number of weaknesses. Uh, only summary trial level data rather than patient level data were available. So it was possible to conduct time to event. It was not possible to conduct time to event analyses or to evaluate the time course of risks. And they note in this setting the possibility that the findings were due to chance cannot be excluded. So the meta-analysis could be basically irrelevant. Well, as, as you are very well pointing out, there are limitations to any study. There are particular limitations to the meta-analysis. Uh, we took the, the opportunity to recognize this along with other information were clues in any kind of detective game, but we had to look at all the clues, all the information, all the data from all sources. Now, you had done your own meta-analysis. Am I right on that? That's correct. Prior no, to this article. I'll, Dr. Delpan yeah, speaks please. specifically to our analysis on that, Mr. Davis. That's what I'm interested in. Okay. So in August of 2006, the company submitted uh, what was called a pooled clinical trial analysis, essentially a meta-analysis. Um, that was one of two studies they submitted. They also submitted a large observational epidemiologic study. The pooled clinical trial analysis, the meta-analysis, suggested a risk of heart attacks, let's call it, um, while the observational study did not suggest that risk. So one of our challenges was to try to reconcile this apparent difference. Um, as part of that, we looked into both of these studies and we realized that there were some methods that the company um, used that we didn't think were the best methods given the data they had. We had the data and our statisticians um, have recently completed their own meta-analysis of, the, um, of the data. And what are your statisticians concluded? Uh, the, the statisticians uh, came up with um, a numerical finding that's similar to the companies and similar to Dr. Nissen's, approximately a relative risk of 1.4. Now, th the job of the FDA at this point is to, to look at those data in, in um, how can I put it, in, in a more granular level to look to see if there's subgroups of patients who may be at particular risk, to analyze the data more to see what's contributing to that, and also to put it in the context of all the other data we have. So that's an ongoing process. So you now. haven't reached any conclusions yet, is that fair to say? No, the agency hasn't reached a conclusion on this, no. Would you say even with your um, setting, uh, looking at both of them, that the, that the findings could, could be due to chance? Um, I, I think that's a question more for a statistician. I, I think that from someone who's interested in drug safety, uh, I always have to consider that possibility, but I have to actually look at what the data are telling me as well about the numerical evidence of risk. Now, the testimony also mentioned that FDA is going to convene an advisory committee in the near future. Um, when do you plan to convene the panel? The advisory committee meeting is now scheduled for uh, July 30th. It's the end of July and it's been published in the Federal Are Register. they Are they going to look strictly at Avandia or is it going to examine other drugs in its class? Um, the focus will be on Avandia, but because of the nature of the studies, um, we're going to be looking at um, other drug or other oral agents to treat diabetes. They're all involved in the same study. Yeah. So 
We'll I mean, to, people get very confused when this stuff gets out in the media and it gets very, you know, unfiltered. And uh, some others in the medical community have argued that too many warnings on a drug label can lead to as much harm as too few warnings because it leads the, uh, to the underuse or the underprescribing of effective drugs to treat certain conditions. How does FDA reach an appropriate balance between caution about safety and unnecessary concern? Well, Mr. Davis, I think you, you're making an extremely important point that I tried to emphasize in my oral statement. I mean, our challenge, first of all, is to take the data associated with this particular drug, which is, in fact, very voluminous, very complex, and very complicated come to an analysis and an understanding of what has it told us about this specific drug as it relates to its complications. Also, what has it told us about drugs that may be very similar to it? Secondly, then take that information and put it into context of what should be our appropriate action, what's the right thing to do for patients. If we have to, in that regard, weigh the benefit of what would occur if we continue to use this drug under certain circumstances and provide information to patients and doctors, or if we were to withdraw this drug and everything else like it, what would that mean to patients who were now deprived of an important therapy to control their diabetes, and what would their alternatives be, and what were the complications of those alternatives, for example, if they had to go on insulin? Right. So we, the FDA, are not looking at one slice or one piece in isolation. The big We're looking at every piece and putting it together into a comprehensive decision of what the right thing to do is for patients. Have similar drugs also been subject to meta-analysis by either you or anyone else? And, who, and if so, what have they found? We, we have requested that the manufacturer of the other drug in this class, pioglitazone, which is marketed as Actos, perform a similar meta-analysis of their short-term studies. Other than that, I'm not aware if there have been other published uh, meta-analyses for the other drugs. Gerald may know. I'm not aware of uh, published meta-analyses for di diabetes drugs. Are you, can you, could you give me a scientific reason why you might have that cause and effect uh, that the uh, meta uh, that the uh, Nissen report uh, in their meta analysis uh, thought up w why the cause and effect would be higher risk of heart attacks. I'm sorry, I don't really understand. I'm trying question. to understand why uh, we understand what the meta analysis in the article New England Journal said. Can you give me a scientific reason why you would get that conclusion with higher uh, incidence of heart attack, given uh, your understanding of the drug? Right. I, I think that what the meta-analysis does, it's a technique to bring together s smaller trials, which each individually. Well, it shows the results, but I'm tra asking, not, not, not the results. I'm asking, then what, what's the ra what is the reason? What, what, why does this happen? You, um, well, because, one of the things I think your question is pointing out, Mr. Davis, is the need for us to understand more about the mechanisms that's what I'm trying to get of at. these drugs. I'm a lawyer. I'm not in this. Right. And, and as we know more about the mechanisms as well as observe the effects that they're having on patients, then we will be in a much better position to make decisions about so, safety. So you don't know at this point, in other words. No. And in fact, that one might suggest it's a little paradoxical. You would, might conclude that the effect on microvasculature would be to have improved it rather than okay. to predispose to infarction. I do have one last question. In your testimony, you say that the FDA approves a drug only after a sponsor demonstrates that drug's benefits outweigh its risks for a specific population in a specific indication and shows that the drug meets the statutory standard for safety and effectiveness. Does the FDA still believe that Avandia continues to meet those statutory standards? We are in the midst of an analysis as we speak, and we have not arrived at a conclusion regarding the fi that final decision. Up to this point in time, we, we clearly have believed that it was an important part of the armamentarium. We have issued changes in the label to, to provide appropriate warnings as we had the data to support it, and we'll continue to do that. And if the data changes or alters uh, after our decision after this current analysis that we're in the midst of, we'll take appropriate action. But it's, it, I guess my question is, you, it, it meets the standards until you conclude otherwise, basically. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Davis. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and uh, Dr. Von Eisenbach. It's good to see you again. I want to thank you for being here and thank you for your testimony. 
On um, May the 21st, the Food and Drug Administration issued a safety alert on Avandia. Could you tell us as close to possible exactly what that means? Yeah. I'm going to let the, Dr. Uh, Jenkins uh, and Dr. Delpan speak specifically to that. Mr. Davis, the intent of the announcement from the FDA was to communicate to physicians and patients and other health care providers about the status of the information so that they could be aware of the findings from the meta-analysis, aware of other data that FDA was reviewing from other trials that we have talked about a bit already this morning, as well as to give advice to physicians and patients about how we felt they should respond to this new information. We particularly wanted to make sure that patients got the message that they should not stop taking the drug precipitously. If they had concerns, they should speak with their doctor because going off of a drug for diabetes uh, without careful attention can lead to your diabetes being out of control, which has its own health risk. The, the, the Food and Drug Administration, of course, knew prior to this article and prior to the issuance of this information that there were potential side effects for the use of, of the drug. Is that correct? Yes. What had the Food and Drug Administration done, if anything, to help make the general public more aware of these side effects? The primary vehicle by which we communicate about the risk and benefits of drugs is through the approved labeling for the product. And we have made numerous changes to the Avandia labeling over the year since it has been approved to reflect emerging information and new information about the risk. When we make those changes to the labeling, we uh, share those through a, a system we have with many stakeholder groups and public uh, patient groups, uh, professional societies, so that they are aware of the changes. They are often communicated to the physicians through letters from the company and through the uh, promotional materials. So those are the primary vehicles that we have utilized uh, for Avandia. Mr. Davis, let me also, if you will allow me, um, this is an extremely important issue for the FDA of the future in terms of our continuous improvement of how we communicate uh, both to professionals and most importantly to patients uh, and to patients of a diverse population. We are approaching that, first of all, to learn more about how to do that even better. And we have issued guidances with regard to communicating drug safety information. We now have put in place a risk communications advisory committee to help us learn how to do that. We are paying particular attention to the vehicles we use, including our website. And we are engaged in a major overhaul of the FDA website. And the, and the initial project in that overhaul is to address the part of our website that, that is a prepared for consumers, for patients, so that they can come to the FDA and get information in a form that is understandable and useful to them as they need to make informed decisions about their health care, but to do that in the context of a relationship with their physician. Are we of the opinion that this causes <laughs> physicians now to know anything that they did not already know? I am saying if I am a physician and I have studied and I pay close attention to what I prescribe and what I do, did I learn anything from this that I didn't already know? Well, what we hopefully have done, and even going back to April of 2006 when we added a warning uh, in the labeling of Avandia is that as doctors are caring for patients and they are looking at those patients with diabetes who they believe are at greater risk of cardiovascular problems or already have an underlying cardiovascular <coughs> history, that they will be able to make much better informed decisions about whether this drug or some alternative drug is the most appropriate treatment for that specific patient. So it arms them with more information and more awareness to make patient-by-patient patient decisions. 
I know that my time is about to expire. Mr. Chairman, let me just ask this one question, kind of following up on the opening statement of uh, Representative Towns. Is there anything that the Food and Drug Administration can do to help assure that there is greater diversity in the clinical trials that are often used to determine the viability of pharmaceutical drugs? I mean, we all know that when it comes to African Americans and some other population groups, there is a paucity, and it's very difficult to have data that actually reflects the impact on this particular population group. A absolutely, Mr. Davis, and we're approaching that from a number of perspectives. One, uh, as, as you're well aware from our previous conversations, even our relationship with NIH and continuing to find ways to encourage participation of minority and underserved populations in clinical trials so that we can learn about that in specific. To also, uh, we have been reaching out at the FDA as a part of our overarching diversity initiative, and I've had meetings with the National Medical Association leadership specifically to address the issue of how can we get representation, especially from the African American community in this situation, in the FDA as part of our advisory process, as part of our committee structure, so that there's the richness of their representation as we go about the process of our regulatory activity. So we're coming at it from both uh, ends of that, of that spectrum, the leadership that's required, the involvement at the FDA level, and then promoting opportunities at the clinical trials level so that we learn, understand, and conserve those populations more appropriately. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, Mr. Issa? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Von Enschenbach, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and summarize what I think I heard. Sure. You don't know whether or not there are any in this class of drugs or in this particular one drug, if there are any side effects that essentially say, we'll help you with your blood sugar, but we may hurt your heart. That, that's what I heard, particularly from Dr. Pan. What we, what we have, I think, tried to communicate uh, is the fact that we have had signals and indications about this, this drug. As those signals and indications have had the adequate scientific data uh, in support of a conclusion, we have made that conclusion and taken a step to inform the public and, and physicians about what we have known. <laughs> Well, well, okay. For example, the my, warning. My, my time is limited, but yeah. you know, my summary is the one that I wanted the question answered on. Basically, you, you're saying here today that, and I use the word anecdotal, and maybe that's not perfect, but uh, uh, Dr. Neeson in, in his, uh, Nyson in his, his upcoming testimony is going to say that uh, there, was, there were several small and medium-sized clinical trials that are insufficient to answer a scientific question. <laughs> He's going to observe that this group already has a high risk of heart disease, and that in fact his own his own his own study, which he published, which caused this hearing to be rushed uh, here today, uh, three weeks later, is not in fact based on sufficient study to reach. Uh, it looks like my time is coming and going, no, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I apologize. I misunderstood your question. You're you correct in the sense that we are in the midst of making that decision right now. Up to this point in time, we have not had sufficient data okay. of, of a nature that we could rely upon to draw that conclusion, but we are assessing that as we speak, okay. and we are taking that to an advisory committee at the end of July. Well, then let me, let me change my line of questioning. If, if it is insufficient and premature for us to be having this hearing on this drug and this line of drugs, which I think it is, I think this is not settled science, you are certainly not here to tell us it is. Then let us go through. I, I don't have a family history of diabetes, but I do have a family history of, of heart disease. So I just want to go through real quickly my understanding of a little bit of the history of heart disease so that something that is much more settled you can comment on. Uh, when you were in medical school, or maybe before, uh, they used to open somebody's chest and sprinkle talc in there in hopes that it would promote growth of, of, of arteries and veins and so on. And that was the best medical science they had at the time. Now, this is not a, ph this is not a pharmaceutical 
uh, per se. Uh, you know, there was no prescription there. But that's what they did because that was the best they could do. And looking back, it probably, well, not probably, it undoubtedly killed more than it saved because of the risk of opening somebody's chest. Is that right? That, that's fair a, to say. That's a fair assessment. <laughs> okay. And then we went through a long period of time of, of yanking out one vein and putting it into another part in hopes that patching in a new one was going to take care of it. And we thought we were doing better, but now the studies show that in at least some categories of patients, they're more likely to die on the table or as a result of it later than they are to be saved or get a, a, a longer quality of life. Okay. And having had my father go through that and then die, I'm acutely aware of it. Now, in my own district, uh, it's no longer, but it was Guidant Pharmaceutical. Uh, Guidant was a major manufacturer of stents. So I've had, I've had the coded, uncoded stent uh, question going on and on and on. And it appears as though you approved, in good faith, both coded and uncoded stents, and in both cases felt they were going to do certain things. And now that the studies are in, at least on certain ones, historically, some of them simply are not going to do a very good job for a long period of time, and you'd be better off not having them than having them. Isn't that correct? That's correct. Okay, so isn't the pattern and the likely future, based on that past, I'm just using that anecdotally myself, based on that past, you're going to always be in a position in which you're, you have to face allowing a drug which shows promise and then, in fact, recognizing that in, in the long run, maybe 15, 20 years later, the alternative to analysis, paralysis by analysis is that you go forward with drugs that have promise, as this one does, uh, that show in clinical trials it does one thing good, and then, unfortunately, over a long period of time, you may find out, as a matter of fact, about the time it's an obsolete drug and there's another one, you may find out that on balance you wouldn't have done it if you knew everything that you can only know 10 years later. Isn't that right? It's absolutely correct. Sir. Okay. So when I'm looking at this hearing today, because I'm, I'm a dedicated member of this committee for oversight and reform, I'm seeing two things. One is, from an oversight standpoint, we shouldn't be second-guessing your science even though I just went through that sort of in the case of heart disease, that we have to accept that as long as your function, just a moment, Chairman, as long as your functional system is not, is as good as science and minds can be, that we have to accept that there's those risks are going to be part of the process and that 10 years from now, a number of drugs or a number of procedures that are common today will no longer be common because of what we learn over time. Okay. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I yield no. back. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Rice. I'm sorry the system is not working, but we gave you the time. Before I, I recognize the next member, just to clarify something that uh, members ought to be aware of, Dr. Van Eschenbach, before a drug is approved, you can demand any test from the manufacturer that you think is pertinent to safety and effectiveness. Isn't that true? We, we, correct. We, J John, Dr. Jenkins may want to comment on that. Well, just, just yes or no. You have the power to say we need more information on yeah. this or we need more information on that. That's true. Give us, give us a test the on it. The statute says all tests reasonably applicable. Okay. After the Mr. drug. Mr. Chairman, it, yeah. point of uh, privilege, uh, whose time are you speaking If on? the gentleman would permit, I just think we ought to have this clarification. Uh, now, after the drug is approved, can FDA demand that a test be done on any Thing related to efficacy or safety, or do they have to negotiate it with the company to get the company to do it? Mr. Chairman, there are certain places where we do have the authority to require studies after approval. In other places, the studies are negotiated agreements between us and the manufacturer. Uh, and this, with this particular drug, and I'm sure it's true of a lot of others, your approval uh, for the approval, there was a strong recommendation that the test be done on heart attack risks. Could you have demanded such a test be done? Well, at the time of approval, we did, in fact, have a post marketing commitment for the long term safety study to address the medical but a lot of those concerns. A lot of those commitments aren't kept. Could you demand they be kept? Well, we certainly monitor those commitments and expect them to be kept. They are written commitments to the agency and we expect them to be honored. And in this case, the company did do the study in a timely manner and reported it to us earlier this year. 
you, uh, and I yes. think the, the point that perhaps um, we should emphasize, Mr. Chairman, is that if we, by virtue of the absence of that data, uh, believe that that drug should no longer be available to patients in terms of our ability to assure and protect the and promoting the public health, we can require that drug to be withdrawn. Right. right. Some people call that a very strong nuclear option, but that is your option at that point. Uh, I did want to clarify that issue of the FDA law. Uh, Mr. Tierney, you are next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and uh, it is exactly the line of questioning I wanted to proceed on, doctors, uh, if I could. You ha your FDA physician originally, the one who looked at the original application, was concerned about adverse effects on the heart. Uh, he was, I, as I understand, he was concerned about uh, bad cholesterol increases, uh, increases in weight, uh, and concluded that a post-approval study of cardiac effects should be a condition of approval. Am I right so far? That is what the medical officer recommended, and that's what we implemented with the adopt post-marketing commitment. Uh, your approval letter stated that. Yes. And then it wanted a, a study after approval looking at cardiovascular risks. Well, the approval letter said what I said earlier. It asked for a four-year long-term safety and efficacy study, including looking at cardiovascular and hematologic events, the liver events, right. and So included body in that was gain. the safety and the cardiovascular events yes. on that that you wanted. Now, Glasso Smith Klein in their ADOPT study didn't really do that. Um, what they did on the ADOPT study was they looked at the control, whether or not it controlled elevated blood sugar. The primary endpoint for the ADOPT study was an efficacy endpoint comparing how well rosiglitazone compared to two other commonly used medications, but they also did specifically collect information and submit and analyze information about safety of the liver the heart and other aspects, yes. I mean, people tell us, and I think you will agree, that the study was too small, really, to get at heart risk, you know, and it also had no independent panel to even look at the, the heart-related matters, right? The study was never designed to be a specific study for heart attack at the time it was designed in 1999. But, all right, so let me bring you back to your FDA physician in the original application. He was concerned about heart attack. He was concerned about various heart effects. He was concerned including about heart attack, right? including heart attack, but also including congestive so heart failure. We didn't have with the ADOPT study enough information to really give us an answer on heart attacks uh, on that. And my, I guess my question is, you know, the stakes being so high, and if in fact, you know, uh, Dr. Nissen is correct in his analysis, some 30 to 40 percent increase in heart attack possible from this, we could have a serious health problem here. So. Why didn't we have a clinical uh, test or the data designed on a post-marketing study? It, it does, the FDA, as I understand it, did not insist on the particularity of that on when we got the heart attacks. But afterwards, you don't have the power to, uh, to do a post-study except in very isolated instances, if I'm, if I'm correct. So, Dr. Von Eschenberg, like, do you believe the FDA ought to have the authority to require uh, more specific and better post approval test? I, I think the point that um, maybe Dr. Jenkins was making was that the concern at the time was, was with regard to toxicity across a number of organs. With the issue of the heart, the concerns because of the nature of the drug would be more around the idea of heart failure. Those things were included sorry, in the no, study. You are telling me now that you think that your FDA, the original doctor, was concerned with heart failure but not heart attack? I think he was concerned about cardiac events. But what we know about these drugs would make you think that that would be more likely heart failure, fluid accumulation, and edema that could put stress on the heart. I, I guess I'm having trouble with that because uh, the impression that we had clearly from the physician was that he was concerned about heart attack long range as a result of a bad cholesterol increase and the increase in weight. You're saying that's not the case. He was just worried about a little I, bit of heart. Well, I, I can't speak specifically to that particular individual's concerns. I, I'm raising a general concern that in, in retrospect, now that we have the data that we are discussing today, this issue of heart attacks as in different or separate from heart failure is an important area that needs to be explored and concerned. And that is apparent to us now. I don't know that it was as obvious to everyone back in 1999. Doctor, do you support legislation that would give you and your, your agency the authority to require post-market studies? 
Well, as I've indicated, uh, Congressman, I believe very strongly that we have to be engaged in post-market surveillance and pharmacovigilance, and there is legislation that's underway that is addressing those specific issues, so and I'm looking forward to working with you on that. try not to be impolite, but the press is a very straightforward question. Do you support legislation that would give your agency the authority to require post-market studies? I, I would look forward to discussing that legislation in an effort to get us to a point where we will be able to get opportunities to collect appropriate data in the appropriate way and the complexity but the of that study we're discussing. Require that, wouldn't that do it? A post-market study is an, ex is an extremely important tool. The information technologies are extremely important tools. So if it's an extremely important tool, would you not support legislation that would give you that extremely important tool? I would support legislation that would give us the resources to be able to have those tools and, and be able to implement them. <laughs> you know, I'm going to take that as a yes, but uh, <laughs> because what the hell, why not? Uh, on that. I mean, I would understand the FDA's, you know, the, the drug companies run around the rosary like that, but I'm not sure I understand uh, your reluctance to, to be direct on that. I mean, it's your job to protect well, public it, health. It's legislation that's currently in, in process. I know, I sir, found and it. I'm, I, I, I know, and I'm in, <laughs> engaged, we're engaged in providing technical assistance in that legislation, and I look forward to continuing to participate in that process. <laughs> so I can look forward to your assistance in writing legislation that will give your agency the authority to require post-market studies. <laughs> and I'd be happy to sit down and talk about that with you. And I'll, I'll look happy. forward to that, sir. Good. Thank, thank you. You'll thank you, Mr. Chairman. Your time is up, even though the light's still is green. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a fairly brief comment, and, uh, and my colleague may want to use the remainder of my time. Uh, Commissioner, in your written, your written testimony states that while meta-analyses are often informative, they have important limitations, and FDA has been historically cautious in the use of meta-analyses in support of regulatory decisions. To your knowledge, has the FDA ever acted solely on the basis of a meta-analysis? Congresswoman, I'm going to ask the, the two experts on either side in terms of ever having acted on it. I, uh, quite frankly, cannot answer that factually right now. Yes, I, I can provide some insight to that. We are very cautious about the use of meta-analysis to demonstrate the efficacy of a drug. So I'm not aware that we've ever used a meta-analysis to form the basis of showing that a drug is effective. We do consider pooled analyses of studies or meta-analysis, as I'm sometimes called, when we're looking at safety data. In fact, that's one of the primary ways we look at safety data in an application is we pull it all together because any one study is usually not adequate to provide us with the information. We did recently make a regulatory decision about a drug called Zelnorm that was primarily based on a safety signal that was derived from a pooled analysis of their uh, clinical trials where the evidence of the risk of a heart effect was very large, and we thought it was so convincing that it was actionable to recommend that that drug come off the market. Thank you. You, you, you want to yield, yield your back time? the remainder of my time to my colleague, Mr. McHenry, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I thank my colleague from uh, North Carolina. Um, the uh, there was a stakeholder meeting in, in May, uh, May 29th, um, regarding the safety alert on Avandia. Who participated in that meeting and what was the outcome? We, Dr. von Eschenbach participated in that meeting. I participated in that meeting. Uh, several others from the center, including the center director. We invited, I think, over 40 uh, stakeholder organizations, professional societies, patient groups, et cetera. I think approximately Somewhere in the teens were the number of groups that were actually represented. Some were in the room with us. Some were on the phone. What was the outcome? We had a discussion about there to help them understand where we were in our analysis of the data, the scope of the large number of trials that we're evaluating to try to come to our decision about Avandia. They expressed their interest in assisting us in better communicating this information to patients in particular parts of society that may not get access to the information through the usual pathway. So it was a discussion 
and an information sharing um, meeting, not a action meeting per se. And if I may, Congressman, just from the per perspective of the commissioner, I believe very strongly uh, the, the, for the need for FDA to be open, transparent, and, and proactive in our communications. And one of the things we wanted to accomplish in, the, in this meeting was to address with, with stakeholders, with especially patient groups, the FDA's ongoing investment, commitment, and involvement in coming to a scientific conclusion and answer, and then whatever action that, that deemed appropriate. And to, in the meantime, to also help them understand that communicating that to prematurely and abruptly uh, stop this medication uh, where patients might choose to do that on their own could lead to, to other serious problems if their diabetes was uncontrolled and to always reemphasize the need for these decisions to be made in a doctor-patient uh, relationship. And it was an important part of our communication strategy. And uh, final question uh, to you, Dr. Von Um What do you think the implications are of elevating a safety review office uh, within FDA. What do you think those impl implications are? And could that possibly offset the, the balance, um, uh, offset the balance of benefits to, to patients and life-saving medications? I think we need, as you see from the two gentlemen on either side of me, the diversity of focus within the FDA that looks at these issues from different perspectives, but does it in an integrated and coordinated way. And more and more, Science is moving us in the direction that information, data, scientific data is telling us both about the effectiveness of a drug and the safety or adverse events associated with that drug so, so simultaneously. So rather than stovepiping, it, it would be integrated? It would be, in my opinion, moving into the modern era that would be more destructive than constructive to what we want as an ultimate outcome. And I look for greater integration. Uh, but rather than separation. Gentlemen, gentle ladies, time has expired. Uh, Mr. Tierney, you are recognized next. I mean, no, Mr. Tierney, Mr. Lynch. <laughs> you got us mixed up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the witnesses for coming before this committee and helping us with our work. Uh, I would like to ask about the uh, warning labels connected with the Vandia. Uh, and Dr. Eschenbach, in your written testimony, you said that in April of 2006, the labeling for Avandia was updated to include new data in the warnings section about potential increases in heart attacks and heart-related chest pain in some patients. You also told USA Today uh, with regard to the risk for heart attacks that, quote, about a year ago we began warning the public about the possible risk in Avandia's labeling. Uh, again, Dr. Von Eschenbach, perhaps you can assist the, the committee right now. Uh, there is a physician's desk reference being provided to you, uh, which, as you know, it contains uh, all the updated labels for uh, prescription drugs. And uh, a new version of the 3,500-page book is printed each year. And we've, we've actually uh, flagged a, a section for Avandia for your convenience. Now, can you tell me? And, and can you tell the committee where the risk for heart attack uh, warning is in the text of the label? Because I, I, I read it and I, I could not, I actually had a couple of physicians read it and they couldn't tell me either. And I remember, you know, the, the earlier statement you had about the warnings of heart attacks and chest pain. And uh, if you could just tell me in the, the text there, I couldn't find it. Congressman, we're, we're, we're looking at that as, as you are questioning us, but I would, uh, in the meantime, uh, emphasize the point you're making. Uh, as a physician, uh, I recognize the inadequacy of the portrayal of this kind of information. And in fact, uh, earlier this year, the Food and Drug Administration initiated a revision of the label in terms of our ability to provide the meaningful, important information that a physician and a patient needs to get to immediately at the front end of this process uh, so that it would be easily available to any physician who had to find it. Uh, at the same time, we are moving towards an electronic label 
that would not depend upon publication of desk references, but would be immediately available in real time electronically so that when we make a change, it isn't a delay in another publication of a hard copy, but something that would be available in real time. Have you found it, Doctor? Uh, because even, even after I read through it and, and, and read the, the applicable yeah, text, I, I well, couldn't divine the... I'll, I'll draw your attention to page 1387 and yeah. 1388. Uh, there is a section, warnings, cardiac failure and other cardiac events. Okay, could you, could you just read the language that's supposed to warn me about a heart attack? That's, that's what I'm interested in. It, placebo versus Avandia ischemic adverse events, myocardial infarction, 2% with regard to placebo, 5% with regard to Avandia. Is that in the table or is that, it's wh in, where it's is in, that? It's in the table in this, in this drug label. That's it? There's a whole section on this, cardiac that, failure and cardiac event. That study of that table is for a couple of hundred people. Two, two in it, it's non, non Avandia and five in Avandia. I mean, you're not, you're not, you're not seriously telling me that, that that's it. Well, ac actually, the, the power of that, well, the point is, the doctor. In page 1387, doctor. there's doctor. a long section on, ad, card, on contraindications and warnings, cardiac failure and cardiac events, and, and drew your attention specifically to the Cardiac data. events is not, not heart attack, though. Congestive heart failure is, not, is something gradual over time. I'm asking you where the, the inf I understand infarction that comes in under it's in four-point type. It's, it's one line in a table. You're not seriously suggesting that that's the warning. John, I'm going to ask Dr. Jenkins to describe, perhaps better than I'm able to do right now to you, Congressman, about the, this information. This language was added in April of 2006, and it specifically refers to a study that was done in patients with pre-existing congestive heart failure to look primarily at the function of the heart. How well did the heart function? And as an out let me please finish. As an outcome of that study, when we reviewed it, we noticed that there was an imbalance in the events for heart attack and heart-related chest pain, but they were not conclusive because, as you pointed out, the study was small. So we put the study in the labeling as a warning, and it says, although no treatment difference and change from baseline with ejection fractions was observed, more cardiovascular adverse events were observed with Avandia treatment compared to placebo during the 52-week study. See Table 7. Table 7 is the table that Dr. Von Eschenbach just pointed to where it shows ischemic adverse events, myocardial infarction. My time is limited. I, I, you're repeating what, what, what the doctor already said. Look, all I'm saying is that you, you cannot be serious about locating the warning in a label referred to, uh, you know, four-point type, it's, it's this small, uh, it's, it's in an adjacent table to the warning, it's, it, and, and the warning, uh, the study that you've selected, you've got thousands and thousands and thousands of people who have gone through these various studies. You select a very small portion of them, and, and you're warning people who have been on insulin or who have had heart failure. Sure. What about the millions of other people who are diabetic and, and have not been, uh, you know, on insulin and who have not experienced uh, heart failure, congestive heart failure? What about all those folks? Because I, I read the label, the warning, and it talks about just those two groups. Then it refers to another very obscure reference uh, in a table. I mean, that is, this is really absurd. This is ridiculous what, what you're saying is a warning. This is, if I wanted to hide something, I would do this. Mr. Lynch, your time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Dr. Just, Lynch, I, I fully appreciate the concerns and the criticisms of what we have used for, for decades uh, in the practice of medicine, the physician's desk reference. But the type size with regard to this warning is absolutely no different than the type size in any of the other drugs on the other 3,500 pages in this book. It's not an intent 
to sequester or hide. It's just the, the vehicle that we have to work with. Thank you, uh, Mr. You're Cannon. dealing with well, Mr. Mr. Cannon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, we had a lot of pictures clicking there, but I'm not sure the record is going to reflect the size of the book that you were just holding up, uh, Dr. Eschenbach. That's the kind of thing you could have stood on a on the parapet of a a castle and thrown on the attacking enemy and crushed their heads. It is so big. <laughs> Um, I, I, and I, I, this questioning, I think, really reflects the underlying problem of the complexity of how we deal with drugs that are that deal with the human body in complex ways, and how do we identify what the the issues are, uh, and 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 therefore uh, deal with them through the FDA. And uh, I appreciate the chairman's holding this hearing. Uh, we, we had earlier some discussions am among members uh, about the role of the New England Journal of Medicine, and and I think the one one of the points that was missed there is that the New England Journal of Medicine, a, an enormously important journal, has an editorial position that they would like to see the FDA change the nature of the way we do business in America. And that's, that's acceptable. That's a great debate. My concern is the sensationalization of the process that scares people when we have a problem um, with, with drugs. And virtually all drugs are going to, they're going to be helpful, but they'll also have uh, sidebar problems. And now, Dr. Eschenbach, you and I, Von Eschenbach, you and I have uh, spoken personally on these issues, you know that I am committed to change and improvement in the FDA. We have also spoken in public hearings and said pretty much the same thing. And uh, we recognize opportunities, but I am concerned about how we go from here to there. In other words, I think doing Bayesian studies instead of double blind studies is an, an important step that we need to take. But we have to do it in the context of procedures uh, that work. And here, what we have is, I think, some alarmism that's, that is extraordinarily important to many people who are suffering from a disease that is difficult and for whom this, uh, this drug is, is helpful. But just to sort of give it another perspective, we have a, uh, I'm, I'm going to submit for the record, but read here. Um, in fact, I ask unanimous consent to submit this Lancet uh, Journal. Uh, Without objection, that will be the order. Taken together, these results, although based on very small numbers of events, certainly raise a signal of concern. Now, signal is, I think, a term of art in, in the system here, which means we ought to look at it. There is something that we ought to be looking at. So it raises a signal of concern and indicate the need for more reliable information about, uh, essentially, I can't say this name, we call it uh, uh, the drug at hand, Rosiglitzazoni or whatever. It is, pardon me. It is not, not the one we, we use when we are asking the pharmacist about it. Um, about the safety of the drug, but the FDA physicians and patients can reasonably wait the results of record, a phase three trial designed specifically to study cardiovascular outcomes. Until the result, results of record are in, it would be premature to overinterpret a meta analysis that the authors and the New England Journal of Medicine editorialists all acknowledge contains important weaknesses. To avoid unnecessary panic among patients, a calmer and more considered approach to the safety of Avendia is, that's not what they say here, but I'll call it Avendia, is needed. Alarmist headlines and confident declarations help nobody. This is not a matter of confidence. This is a matter of what happens to people uh, when they take this drug. Now, um, the, the problem here is what I think are called surrogate endpoints. And, uh, you know, like controlling blood sugar levels, uh, with, with Avendia and other, other diseases. It takes 10 to 15 years to discover and develop a new medicine. Without such endpoints for evaluating a diabetes medicine, for example, what would the development and approval pr uh, process, wouldn't it take much longer? And how much longer would, would it take if it does? And do you agree with the value of using surrogate endpoints? Dr. Von Eschenbach. Yes, sir, I do. And I also echo your uh, important point about the need for continuous improvement. Uh, we're seeing revolutions in science and technology around us that are going to enable FDA to continuously improve, including uh, how we use clinical trials, new clinical trial type designs that will be much more informative. We will also be using many more tools of, of science in biomarkers and genomics, et cetera, that's going to help us with regard to the ability to use these biomarkers and these uh, intermediate endpoints. May I, may I just, I see my time is about to expire, but let me just ask the, about this study in particular. The meta-analysis by Dr. Nissen excluded studies in which there were no adverse events. Uh, from layman's point of view, uh, of not including studies where there were no heart attacks or other heart problems, that would seem to skew the results uh, a little. 
But more specifically, with respect to heart attacks, I understand that six studies were not used because none of the patients had a heart attack. Even more studies, approximately half of the overall available, were not used because they were, there were no deaths. Yet uh, headlines screamed about a 43 percent increased chance of death. Is that a responsible way to communicate to the public? Well, we value all data and all input uh, with regard to, to these issues. And this study, uh, like other meta-analysis, has its both strengths and weaknesses uh, that have been discussed and pointed out by others. Uh, and we used it as, as an additional piece of information, but not necessarily one upon which decisions in and by themselves would, would be made. And I will let Dr. Delpan speak specifically to how we use data and meta-analysis. Right. Well, I, I think we've Mr. spoken Chairman, about I see my time has expired, but let me just point out, I, the question I ask is, is it responsible to use this metadata uh, to, to create what is essentially a public panic? I believe that, that the data was being presented in the journal as in a contribution and an additional piece of information. We have all done that in our careers in terms of publishing information and data that we believed was a valuable contribution. We leave it then to the an uh, entire scientific domain to weigh that, add that, evaluate that in the larger context. And I believe that is what was hopefully going to occur here. Other people reacted, perhaps responded to that information and perhaps created some of the concerns that you are alluding to. If the Chair would indulge just one follow-up, there, there is something different from publishing and waiting a reaction and publishing and promoting. Would that be different in your I, mind? I, I can't speak to the, uh, the author's in, intent. I have not had any conversations with Thank Dr. Nissen. Chairman. I see my time has expired and I yield back. The gentleman's time has expired. I now I recognize Mr. Yarmouth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, Dr. Van Aschenbach. I have a question that relates to the, the scope of the risk that we are talking about. And, I think any of us who have watched television commercials and <clears throat> have taken medications and see these percentages have a hard time getting our arms around it. And, and your staff, when they briefed um, the committee on this particular situation, indicated that if these numbers are real, this is a big deal. I think that was one of the direct quotes. And, and you said uh, these data, if confirmed, would be of significant concern because patients with diabetes are already at an increased risk of heart disease. Uh, I want to understand this study. The, the, the GSK data that was presented in August of 2006 basically said, and I think you confirmed this, that uh, those numbers indicate that the risk went from approximately 1.5 percent to approximately 2 percent, which was approximately a third, third increase in the risk. But that um, body of data, 13,000 or so, uh, cases included a lot of <clears throat> a lot of different combinations of um, regimens that were being used. As I understand it, some were taking Avandia by itself, some with insulin, some with um, nothing else. So, in fact, uh, am I not uh, incorrect in saying that, or am I not correct in saying that, uh, for some patients, presumably the conclusion would be that the risk is much higher than the two percent. Um, but we don't know but because we didn't have a breakout of those incidents? The, there are confidence, what we call confidence in, intervals around that number, which means there could be a range mm -hmm. uh, of lower and, and slightly higher risk. And I will let Dr. Delpan speak specifically to those statistical mm -hmm. uh, considerations as we are trying to, to make these decisions. Right. I, I think what you are asking, Congressman, is are there patients or combinations of medications that can uh, confer higher risk and could there be some situations where the risk is lower? And um, that is the kind of thing our statistical analysis is focusing on. Um, we are trying to answer those questions and put the answers to those questions into the larger context to make our decision. So we, you don't know that yet. You are trying to break it, it, break it down. Right. Our, our statistician has finished her review. I haven't finished looking at it extensively, um, but th this is the kind of thing that we're actively engaged in now. Yes. But presumably, in this case, say a um, patient who was taking Avandia and insulin might have a risk of five percent of a heart attack, as opposed to two percent or one percent. I mean, it's, it's right. There possible. are risks that could be higher 
right. than the overall summary risks and of course, what we're, for certain patients. What we're dealing with is a situation in which if a million people are taking a particular medication, a 0.5 percent increase in risk amounts to 5,000 people who are adversely affected who otherwise wouldn't be. So it, it does become a significant risk. Now, at what point would you consider that risk to be of significant peril that some dramatic action w needed to be taken, whether it was the nuclear option or advising doctors to immediately take them patients off the, the medication? Well, you, you're pointing out, Congressman, an extremely important part of what FDA's role is in this whole process. First of all, it is to absolutely critically, rigorously assess the scientific data. Do patient individual analyses, for example, the kind of things you were alluding to, but then put that into a larger uh, context. That brings into play what is the implication of that risk as it relates to the total population of patients with diabetes who might be affected. Are there other alternatives that would be available to them that would get a benefit and perhaps at less risk? Or if there is no other option available, what risk do we deem is appropriate and under what circumstances? Can we advise doctors and patients to be more selective about who should, who should not get that particular treatment? That becomes an important part of our overall decision uh, making process to that end of both protect and promote uh, the public health. Um, and, and I'm concerned because as we watch television commercials and we talk about warnings and, you know, at a certain point the public becomes um, numb to these things because they really don't mean anything. But if you told me that uh, if I went to the grocery in my car and I had a 2 percent risk of being in an accident, I might still take the chance. If I have a 10 percent risk of, of it, I might not drive my car to the grocery. And uh, I'm concerned that what information that FDA provides yeah. to the public and what, and what we do here as well uh, yeah. gives the public adequate uh, explanation of the risk they're taking because for those 5,000 people, presumably it was 100 percent risk. Right. And, and to your point, we, we are attempting to do that even better uh, than we have done in the past by, as I indicated, the initiatives we have with regard to risk communication, the vehicles that we use. Uh, but your point is extremely well taken. Uh, there are issues uh, on which our decision will always be based on the standard of rigorous scientific analysis, whether it's a drug for hay fever or whether it's a drug for diabetes or for cancer. However, from the patient's perspective, the risk-benefit ratio is dramatically different, whether you're thinking about taking a drug for sniffles or whether you're taking a drug for terminal cancer for which there is no other option available to you. And that's an important part of, of this equation that we can't lose sight of. Thank you, Mr. Yarmuth. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Hodes. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Oh, I haven't been yes, recognized. I didn't, I didn't see you. Um, you're, you're recognized for your time. Well, I appreciate it. Um, at this time, I'd like to yield my time to uh, my colleague from California, Mr. Issa. Hi, thank you, Mr. McHenry. Uh, I just want to follow up on two more things before I know you're going to be leaving shortly. Uh, Mr. Cannon's question, uh, it sort of prompted my wanting to, to delve a little further. If you have the study, the study at hand, the study that led to today's hearing, if you have the study taking out, and maybe this is a statistical question, but it doesn't seem like a complex one, taking out those in which nobody died of heart attack, in which nobody got a heart attack, if you take those out, by definition, you put them back in and the 43 percent becomes lower. We may not know how much lower, but significantly lower. Isn't that correct? Inevitably? Well, let me say, you know, none of the three of us here is an expert on the statistical methods of medicine. No, 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 wait a second, wait a second. But there but, are yeah, statistical but let's, issues. You know, I, I only took yeah. two, two years of statistics yeah. in college. It doesn't make me yeah. a statistician, but I know that if you leave the zeros out of a, of a zero through ten and you are averaging, you are going to get a lower amount if you, if you put the zeros in. Isn't that right? Well, we are going to, our, one of the things our statistician is doing is see if there are techniques that she could use to actually address that issue. I can't say conclusively that it would make that risk go away, though. Okay. Do you know of any reason, though, for leaving out 
those who did not suffer. I mean, other than promoting panic, other than getting people to think that this drug had a higher incidence of, of heart attack, is there any reason to leave out other groups who took the drug and didn't have heart attacks? Is there any valid reason that you can think of without knowing anything more than what we've heard today? I, I think it's the statistical issue, but then the issue then becomes looking at all the available data to put it together. But I, I think, um, you know, all these techniques have their statistical basis, and those statistical bases uh, have to be respected to, to do the study. But, well, but I mean, maybe, maybe I'll go back to what we did a couple weeks ago. You know, we did global warming. I happen to believe in global warming. I've been a promoter of reducing CO2 emissions. But I'm trying to understand, if I only took the days of the year that were cooler and I left out the days that were hotter, I could prove the Earth is cooling, not heating. And so I, I'm a little shocked that you're not more concerned that a study published not for peer review, but in fact published for the public and widely reported on and, and linked to, to this hearing today, deliberately ignored those, part, those other patients who could have brought the number more, more to zero. Mr. Dice, I cannot comment on why and how this particular study was done and designed and developed. That's, that's something for the author to comment on. But your point is extremely well taken, that, that th with regard to meta-analysis, it is well recognized that there are, it, they are fraught with problems, statistical problems in terms of how you do them. And in this case, whether you did fixed events or random events uh, in terms of how you analyze the information and data. And that points out, whether it is this meta-analysis or any other meta-analysis, the problem and concern about making definitive, explicit decisions with regard to just a meta-analysis. And, and you have to be mindful of the dangers that that could involve. And that is why the FDA chose to go much further to, since we had patient, individual patient data, which the author indicated was not available to him. And we have expanded and used our expertise of our biostatisticians to take this to uh, an appropriate level, which we are in the midst of doing right now. Okay, I'm going to yield back to the gentleman. I just want to make sure something gets in the record, though. The American Enterprise Institute published something that I think says a lot about the author that we're going to hear from in a few minutes. The study's primary author, Cleveland Clinic cardiologist Stephen Nyson, admitted to the Wall Street Journal that he was in touch with Congress while preparing his analysis. Three days after the study was submitted to the New England Journal of Medicine and before it was published, the FDA commissioner received a letter about Avandia from members of the House Energy and Commerce Committee that seemed to reference the National, uh, the uh, uh, New England Journal of Medicine, Medicine study. I just want to make sure that is in the record and I yield back to the gentleman. I, I thank my friend from uh, California. Um, let, let me just ask a, a broader question. I would like you to touch on this. Now, I, I know uh, your struggles at the FDA to make sure that we have safe drugs on the market. There is a, a proper balance between patient safety and, and life-saving medicine. It is an ongoing struggle. Do you think our regulatory uh, hurdles are too high or just about right or too low? I mean, it, it, so there is a lot of debate going on right now, and I know the Chairman is very interested in this, this issue and actually wants to increase the regulatory hurdle to, uh, hurdles to get drugs on the market. And I would like you all, all three of you, to, uh, to comment upon this, on whether or not that is appropriate or our uh, regulatory level uh, to get a drug on the market is about right or too high? Congressman, I believe that the regulatory levels are ap appropriate for the individual decisions. There are some circumstances in which the regulatory barrier has to be extraordinarily high uh, with regard to this risk and benefit ratio. And I have alluded to that, uh, the reasons why that might be case, whether you are dealing with hay fever or whether you are dealing with cancer. So I think they have to be applicable to the individual situation and circumstance. I think it is important to point out, as I did in my oral testimony, that the world around us is radically changing, rapidly changing. Science and technology, the complexity of the products, the, the circumstances. And we need at the FDA to continue to adapt and respond to those changes. And the resources that we uh, are looking forward to are designed to specifically enable us to do that and continuously improve. So I think it is an issue of uh, using the regulatory framework but continuously improving it and improving our ability to apply it. 
But Je I think the, the standards are appropriate. Gentleman's time has expired. Did Dr. Jenkins, uh, Dr. Penn want to respond to the question or do you agree with Dr. Van Eschenbach? Uh, Congressman, I, I had the office, the Office of New Drugs that makes these decisions every day. So my staff and I make these decisions every day. And it's always a weighing of balancing the certainty you know about the drug versus the uncertainty of things that you don't know about the drug. I think we strike that balance very well and within the framework of the regulations and the statute that have been given to us by Congress to operate in. So I do think we have struck the right balance. Uh, this is clearly a societal public policy question as far as how much certainty do you need to know about a drug before you approve it? How much uncertainty are you willing to accept at the time of approval? You can never know everything about a drug at time of approval. I think it's a public policy debate about uh, where that standard should be set. I think we adhere to the standard that has been set for us by Congress in the statute. Dr. Penn. Yeah, let me just add on to what Dr. Jenkins said that um, there, there always is this residual uncertainty at a time when a drug is approved. And I think for that reason, as Dr. von Eschenbach said, it's important to have a strong post-marketing system as well to be able to um, monitor that uncertainty and come up with a better understanding of the drug's risks as time goes on. Thank you. Mr. Hodes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, gentlemen, thank you for your testimony. Um, much of the focus of this hearing has been on post-market surveillance. Uh, what does the FDA do after a drug is approved? I would like uh, to direct your attention to a slightly different question. Um, I am specifically concerned with what the FDA does to ensure the accuracy of the pharmaceutical direct-to-consumer drug ads after the company's drug has gone to market. I note in uh, Dr. Eschenbach's written testimony uh, the statement, quote, in April 2006, the labeling for Avandia was updated to include new data in the warnings section about a potential increase in heart attacks. Uh, that, was, that was the language you used, Dr. Eschenbach. Um, there was questioning by my colleague, Mr. Lynch, about warnings. Now, yesterday, in both the New York Times and the Washington Post, uh, GSK, uh, the maker of the drug, took out full-page advertisements about Avandia. Uh, in fact, page and a half in the New York Times. I've got it here. I think you have it in front of you. There's a full page which has uh, something on top, and then they have important safety information on the bottom. And then in another half page, there's the patient information. Now, I'm concerned about the gap we seem to have between concern about heart attacks and warnings about heart failure. Because if you're a consumer, plain ordinary guy like me, uh, heart attack means something very different than heart failure, which happens to be, could be uh, the inability of the heart to pump blood, could be a long-term uh, thing. Heart attack is a rather sudden and specific event. Now, despite that you say there were um, uh, label warnings for heart attacks, if I read the language in both the New York Times and the Washington Post, what I see is a warning that says if you have heart problems or heart failure, tell your doctor. Avandia can cause your body to keep extra fluid, which leads to swelling and weight gain. Well, that's a problem. Extra body fluid can make some heart problems worse or lead to heart failure. The word heart attack, which is what consumers understand, doesn't appear. Now, GSK has spent $42 million on advertisements to consumers for Avandia. Its revenue has increased 25 percent in recent years. If I'm right and that this doesn't contain the concerns about heart attacks. Do you believe that consumers understand this warning by GSK to be a warning that there is an increased risk of heart attacks from Avandia? No, sir. I do not believe that looking at an ad like this in the newspaper really helps to provide the kind of depth and understanding that you just described. I think that this does not occur by looking at these kinds of ads. So this ad doesn't use the word heart attacks, does it? I haven't read the complete ad, sir, so, but, but 
I'll take your word that it does not. Because I'm happy to represent to you yeah, with, uh, I'm, with I absolute that. assurance that it doesn't use the that. word heart attacks. Now, in that light, if there is concern, as we now know, about the increased risk of heart attacks, and that, you know, that, that's what you talked about in your testimony, that's what's now come out. And yesterday, this company is still not warning consumers about the increased risk of heart attacks. My question to you, as, as the regulatory agency is, do you have enough power now to do something about the manufacturers and what they're doing with post-consumer advertising? Do you need more power? Do you need different power? What needs to be done for you to adequately regulate how the manufacturers are communicating in simple, plain terms that consumers will understand? As part of the uh, negotiations and discussions with regard to Purdue for, for reauthorization, which is currently in place, we have sought the, the resources to be able to expand our ability to review, survey, and therefore take action against uh, direct-to-consumer advertising. Uh, sir, with great respect, um, this reminds me of your answer to my uh, to my colleague Mr. Tierney's question when he asked you a direct question and you said we're looking for more resources. Now to me resources means maybe people, maybe it means money. By resources do you mean some more regulatory power that you currently do not have to interface with the drug manufacturers to make sure that they are doing what they need to do to tell consumers about the risks you're flagging. I believe right now the most serious concern for me is having adequate numbers of people to be able to monitor and take action against direct-to-consumer advertising when it's inappropriate. That for me is a major area that needs to be addressed. The ability to then to infect that if that becomes a problem that requires legislation is something that I, as I indicated, I think we need to address. But okay, I'm not prepared at the present time to say that's absolutely the answer that I need in order to fix the concern or problem that's being raised. I'm not sure I understand you. If I may just follow up briefly with one question. Are you telling me you don't have enough people to read this ad and see whether or not the ad adequately, in your expert opinion, warns the consumer of the increased risk of heart attack? Are you telling me you don't have enough people to do that? I'm, yes, sir. I'm telling you that I need more resources to be able to direct to the issue of the FDA's oversight of direct-to-consumer advertising. Gentlemen's time has Can, expired. May, may I just have one last question, Mr. Chairman? Thank you. You need more people to read the ad. Fine. Do you have the power that you need to say to the drug manufacturer, fix the ad? I, I believe at the present time I, I do have the ability to get that accomplished and get that done. I, I would certainly, if that is not adequate, after we have done our appropriate intervention, I would be then welcome any legislative action that would require that to be affixed. But at this point in time, I don't believe that's at the core of the problem for me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hodes. Ms. Watson. Thank you so much, and I thank the panelists for indulging us. I, too, have the same concern. I myself have diabetes, too. I had a complete health examination before I took my post as ambassador, no problems. Now, I developed diabetes, too, after two years. All of a sudden, I had a heart murmur, a heart problem. Went to my cardiologist, and he examined me. He said, what are you taking? of Vandia. He said, get off of it. I myself, no history in the family. I have a history of diabetes, yes. He said, get off of a Vandia. There are other options out there. Now, here's my concern listening to the testimony. Why has it taken FDA so long to come and say, we need more resources? Why did so much time pass after your approval? And the post-marketing studies seems to me 
to be a way to reduce the risk that millions of people are under in this country. And I heard your response to Representative Hodes. I heard your response to Turney, but I didn't hear a plea to give us that authority. You ought to have heart attack on the label because that would have been understood. And it looked like I was heading towards just that when I went to my physician. I believe at the, at the core and the heart of the question that, that you've just um, placed before me, Congresswoman, is the issue of the fact that we have attempted to provide information that when a doctor is caring for a patient such as yourself and there seems to be a problem or concern that that is addressed and let that may require my, a change in your medicine. Doctor, that, doctor, let me take back uh, my time because I'll be out of it in just a second. Uh, would you have anything against putting on the label there is a high risk of heart attack that's precisely what we are engaged in determining as we speak. The comprehensive analysis of all of the data related to heart attack, both from meta-analyses as well as other studies, and the deliberation that will occur at the advisory committee at the end of July will lead us to the answer to that specific question. All right, question. thank you, thank you. The stakes are very high. I agree. And you represent us, you give permission, uh, for these drugs to go on the market and too many people are at risk. Now, let me shift my questioning. I am an African American and diabetes is spreading higher among African Americans and now Hispanic Americans than any other group. But I find there are too few of us in the test. And so what can you do to be sure that Americans of all ethnicity become part of your test. I, I fully support and concur. Uh, we are approaching this from, one, the perspective of working with, for example, sister agency, the National Institutes of Health, to be able to promote the participation of more minorities and underserved in the clinical trials themselves. Two, we're approaching this from the the perspective of I am engaging with the National Medical Association and have met with them to lay out specific plans to address that issue, to bring representation from the African American community specifically into the FDA's processes, participation in committees, and the ability for us to address in the appropriate way, the way in which the community believes is most appropriate and effective but to get to the end point, we, do, we absolutely need to serve patients better by having them participate in these clinical trials. Thank you for that response. And I just want to end up by saying the American Diabetic Association had to be forced by a group of us, I represent Los Angeles, to do outreach into these communities. So we had to hold our own outreach uh, informational sessions ourselves. So we need a whole reform in how we meet, meet and reach Americans of various ethnicities. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Ms. Watson. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Watson. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jenkins, Dr. Penn, D Dr. Van Eisenbach, thank you very much for your appearance today and your willingness to answer the questions that we had to uh, ask you. We are, of course, interested in the process uh, that you use to uh, uh, inform the American public about uh, the efficacy and, and safety of these drugs. And I think uh, you, in, your contribution today is helpful to us. And we want, of course, review uh, this situation in the context of uh, legislation that's pending in both the House and the Senate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And on behalf of my colleagues and the entire FDA, let me thank you and the rest of the members of the committee for your consideration and, and your openness to uh, our perspective. Thank you. Well, I, I, I was a little premature in thanking you and expecting that you would, we would move on because uh, we have a number, another distinguished member of our committee who is uh, uh, eager to ask questions, and so I do want to recognize him. Uh, Thank you very much. Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Aschenbach, I want to ask you about the actions of your press office 
over the past two weeks. On May 21st, the New England Journal of Medicine published an analysis of clinical trial data about Avandia that uh, started a vigorous scientific and medical debate that continues today. The analysis provided a signal that Avandia may be associated with increased risk of heart attack. As you acknowledge in your written testimony, if confirmed, this signal, quote, would be of significant concern because patients with diabetes are already at an increased risk of heart, heart disease. You told us in your written testimony how the FDA is committed to, quote, early communication of emerging information about the safety of drugs, stressing that, quote, any communication must be responsible and measured, taking into account the impact that the message will have on patients and practitioners alike to encourage good health, care choices, and help avoid bad ones, unquote. This seems like an appropriate communications strategy. What I want to know is why it was not followed in the case of Dr. Neeson, the author of the, the signal in the New England Journal article. I'm sorry, Mr. Cummings. Could you be more specific about why on May it was 24, not On May 24, just three days after the publication of Dr. Neeson's uh, uh, analysis, at least two individuals in the FDA press office forwarded to reporters in the national media and trade press an article from the website heart.org that contains uh, derogatory comments about Dr. Neeson. Specifically, the article contained accusations from an anonymous commenter to a blog posting in the Wall Street Journal that questioned Dr. Neeson's motives in undertaking and publishing his analysis implying that he was only interested in hurting companies that did not work with him in the, in the uh, Cleveland Clinic. The accusations were so baseless that the website itself later retracted the comments. It said that the accusations, quote, do not meet the highest standards of journalistic or scientific integ integrity or credibility, end of quote. Even worse, one of your press consultants, uh, Douglas uh, Abbasfell, sent out these articles with bizarre titles. One email title was, quote, what are St. Stephen's feet made of? Question mark. Clay, clay perhaps? Question mark. End of quote. Another one read, quote, did you ask Nyson if the Pope called yet? Are you familiar with this? Are you following me so far? Yes, sir. I understand the point. I'd like to request that a copy of the, uh, Mr. Aberfeld's email be included in the record, Mr. Chairman. Uh, First reserving all, the right Com to object. Uh, uh, I have not seen the email. If I'd, I'd love to see a copy of the email before I agree that this should be entered into the record. Gentlemen, withhold this unanimous consent uh, request. And, uh, Very well. Do you believe that, the, 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 well, since I'll have to work with what I've got, do you believe that these actions represent responsible and measured communication no, to which your agency is committed? No, is, sir. No, let me finish. I'm almost finished. Is it really an appropriate use of federal, federal taxpayer dollars to use the FDA press office as a vehicle for attacking scientists who raise important signals about potential public health dangers in prestigious scientific journals? Mr. Cummings, uh, this was not an action on the part of the FDA, the FDA's press office. This was an action of an individual within the FDA I completely concur with you that it is inappropriate and unacceptable. Uh, that individual's supervisor has taken appropriate action with that individual, and I will not condone or accept that kind of behavior. Is by that individual still working uh, with the government? That, that individual is still employed by the government. But and this what action, action was has taken? Been addressed. And what action was taken? This action has been addressed by the individual superior. A letter of reprimand is in his file. But he's still a part. We're still paying him. It was, a, it was an inappropriate and unfortunate ac action on the part of an individual, and I believe that that is being appropriately addressed from a disciplinary point of view. <clears throat> the medical experts who are appearing before this committee this morning have distinguished professional careers. They and their institutions should be proud of the work they have done. And we as a country should not tolerate efforts by either private or public entities that engage in intimidation and smear campaigns against experts who act in the service of the public. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. There has, let me reassure you and other members of the committee, there is absolutely no intention, nor has there been any action on the part of the FDA to take and behave or, or participate in any kind of campaign with regard to Nissen. We have welcomed his information and his data as a part of our ongoing assessment and analysis, although I've never had the opportunity to discuss things with him personally or directly, I would look forward to doing so at any time. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Another member seeks recognition, Mr. Mm -hmm. Shays. Thank you. Um, I don't usually seek recognition when I've come so late in the panel and I don't have a question to ask, but I know that Mr. McHenry would like to just ask a brief question, so I would yield to him. Thank my colleague. And I'd like to follow up with you and give you an opportunity to respond to this. With uh, complex scientific research, is it important that uh, a balanced perspective is, is given on a study that's been released? Do you, is, is that an important yes. function? Yes, it is. Uh, now, additional follow-up to this. Is it necessary for the FDA to perhaps, in order to quell overreaction uh, about a release of a study, uh, to provide a balanced perspective on that study? I, I believe the FDA must accept information and data from a variety of sources, analyze it appropriately, and then take what we believe to be the appropriate action. Well, additional uh, comment here. I mean, it, after uh, the release of the study, there have been a number of articles written about the failures of the study and what is missing in the study. Is that something important for consumers to be aware of? Well, I, I think it's important for everyone to be aware of, of balance and where there's legitimate scientific debate. That should be something that is made that people are aware of. There were issues here where, for example, two journals that are each, each highly reputable had differing perspectives and points of view with regard to this particular study. I think that's an important part of an open, healthy dialogue and discussion. Thank you. Yield back. I yield back. Thank you very much. Again, thank you, gentlemen, for your testimony. We appreciate your being thank here. Thank you, sir. We are uh, now pleased to call uh, forward for our second panel Dr. Stephen Nissen, is the chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic, one of the nation's most respected academic medical centers. He's the immediate past president of the American College of Cardiology. And from 2000 to 2005, Dr. Nissen served as a member of the FDA's Cardio-Renal Advisory Panel and chaired the committee during his final year. Uh, Dr. Nissen was the lead author of the May 21 New England Journal of Medicine article that drew a connection between Avandia and increased cardiac risks. We have also uh, Dr. Bruce M. Satie, uh, who is Professor of Medicine, Epidemiology and Health Services and co-director of the Cardiovascular Health Research Unit at the University of Washington. From 2000 to 2006, he was a member of the Institute of Medicine's Committee on the Assessment of the U.S. Drug Safety System. Dr. Sadie was the lead author for the May 21st editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine, commenting on Dr. Nissen's study and is a lead author of one of the June 5th editorials in the same journal, commenting on the newly released record study. And uh, Dr. John uh, Busey, is a professor of medicine at the University of North Carolina School of Medicine in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, where he serves as a chief of the Division of Endocrinology, one of our nation's most highly respected experts on diabetes care. Dr. Buse is, a, is, a, is president-elect of the American Diabetes Association. He has received numerous awards and honors, including citation in Best Doctors of, in America every year since 2001. Dr. Buse is was the first physician in the country to raise concerns about the cardiovascular safety of Avandia in a letter he wrote to the FDA in 2000. Uh, we welcome the three of you. It's the practice of our committee to ask all witnesses to uh, take an oath, and I'd like you to rise. Do you uh, solemnly swear that the testimony you will give uh, be before this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. I do. The record will indicate that each of the witnesses acted in the affirmative. Um, okay. 
Um, Dr. Nissen, why don't we start with you? We have your, and all of you, we have your full statements in the record. We'd like to ask you to uh, summarize your testimony in uh, around five minutes, and we'll have a clock that I hope will work appropriately to let you know. Yellow light means uh, that the time, one minute is left. Red light means the time is up. And we would like to ask you, when you see the red light, to um, conclude. Um, there's a button on the base of the mic. Be sure it's pressed in, and we want to hear from you. Dr. Nissen. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Waxman. My name is Stephen E. Nissen, MD. I am chairman of the Department of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Cleveland Clinic and the immediate past president of the American College of Cardiology. My testimony does not reflect the views of either the Cleveland Clinic or the ACC. Before I begin, I want to thank the committee. I want to thank uh, the bipartisan efforts of this committee to look into issues of drug safety in the FDA. This is an extremely important issue. It affects all 300 million Americans, and I applaud you for looking into this. I think it is clearly the right thing to do. I have been asked to summarize for the committee the sequence of events and the scientific basis for our manuscript describing the potential cardiovascular risks of Avandia. In September 2006, a clinical trial called DREAM was published in the British medical journal The Lancet. In this study, patients at high risk for developing diabetes were assigned to receive either Avandia or an inactive placebo. Avandia did indeed reduce the incidence of new onset diabetes. However, the DREAM study also showed a numerical excess of heart-related adverse events, including 15 heart attacks in the Avandia group compared with nine in the placebo group. The number of heart attacks was too few to reach statistical significance, but they were trending in the wrong direction. This was potentially an important observation because the reason for giving a drug to prevent diabetes is to reduce the complications of diabetes, the most serious of which is heart disease. Then in December 2006, a clinical trial known as ADOPT was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. This study was designed to show whether Avandia had a more durable effect at reducing blood sugar than two generic diabetes medications. The study indeed showed a more long-lasting reduction in blood sugar with Avandia, but heart-related complications were also trending in the wrong direction. The heart attack rate was 33 percent greater in Avandia-treated patients, but again there were too few events to reach statistical significance. After reviewing DREAM and ADOPT, I was concerned because they were, these were the only long-term large-scale clinical trials comparing Avandia with other therapies, and both studies showed an excess of heart attacks. When you have several small or medium-sized clinical trials that are insufficient to answer a scientific question, the logical next approach is to combine these trials to try to address the issue. This process is known as a meta-analysis. Using this method, I asked one of my colleagues, a statistician, to combine DREAM and ADOPT, and we noted a 40 percent excess of heart attacks, which was not statistically significant but showed a strong trend in the wrong direction, and it was approaching statistical significance. This observation was particularly concerning because heart disease is highly prevalent in diabetics comprising between 65 and 80 percent of all diabetic deaths. A diabetes drug that may increase the risk of heart disease would represent a potentially important public health concern. We sought more data to objectively address this scientific question. Eventually, we located on the FDA website the original group of clinical trials submitted to the agency to support approval of the drug in 1999. There were five clinical trials comparing Avandia to other diabetes drugs or placebo. We again noted that there were more heart-related complications in the Avandia treatment group in these initial clinical trials, but we still did not have enough clinical trial data to form any reasonable scientific conclusions. Eventually, in April 2007, we discovered a GlaxoSmithKline website that disclosed basic information and summary results for clinical trials conducted by the company. Now we had access to the heart attack and death rates for all relevant 42 Avandia clinical trials completed before or after drug approval. 
we completed the meta-analysis which showed a 43% excess incidence of heart attack in Avandia-treated patients, which was statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.03. A p-value of 0 0.03 means that there is a 97% probability that the results of the study are not due to chance alone. We submitted a manuscript reporting our findings to the New England Journal of Medicine, where the manuscript was peer-reviewed and published online on, on May 21, 2007. In our manuscript, we were careful to point out the strengths and limitations of our analysis. Because access, our access to data was limited to publicly available clinical trial data, we could not analyze original patient-level information. In addition, as we pointed out, a meta-analysis is always less convincing than a large prospective trial designed to answer a specific scientific question. Nonetheless, we thought the findings were sufficiently important to warrant prompt publication and concluded, quote, until more precise estimates of the cardiovascular risk of this treatment can be delineated in patients with diabetes, patients and providers should carefully consider the potential risks of rosiglitazone in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. The same 42 trials that we included in our analysis are available to the company and to the FDA. Because both of these organizations have access to raw patient data, they can perform more statistically powerful analyses, which can help clarify the extent of risk. GSK has reported the basic results of their own patient-level patient level meta-analysis on their clinical trials website, which confirms a statistically significant increase in heart-related complications in patients who received Avandia. The FDA also recently announced that their own internal analysis of patient-level data confirms an approximately 40 percent excess of heart-related complications. However, neither the GSK nor FDA analyses have been published and it is therefore not possible to directly compare the results for all three of these analyses. I look forward to discussing these findings and the policy implications with the committee during the course of today's hearings. Thank you very much, Dr. Nissen. Dr. Buse? There's a button on the base of the mic. Uh, Chairman Waxman, members of the committee, it is really an honor to be called to testify before this committee. Uh, before I uh, tell you what I'm really here for, I do want to make two introductory points as a matter of disclosure. First, this statement in my testimony do not reflect the opinions of the, my employer, the University of North Carolina School of Medicine, or the American Diabetes Association, a voluntary health agency for which I serve as an officer. Second, uh, I've been working in the glitazone class uh, since approximately 1992. I have a number of conflicts of interest in that regard, and I've tried to expand those a bit in my written statement, but I don't want to go through that in detail because of my uh, time limitations. Um, so I do want to give some background as to how I got involved in this process. In June of 1999, I was invited to give about six presentations at the American Diabetes Association meetings and the Endocrine Society's meetings um, and dug around through the same databases uh, with the same materials that Dr. Nissen spoke of earlier. Um, I was concerned about the potential of cardiovascular safety because of what I perceived to be an increase in cholesterol um, that was relatively specific to Avandia in, among the three agents that have been marketed in the United States, Avandia, Actos, and Regulin. Um, because of that, uh, I looked for signals of cardiovascular safety and found uh, a signal with regards to a comparison between Avandia and so-called active comparators in the initial Avandia uh, data set. Uh, I realized that was a potentially explosive issue, uh, reviewed these data with colleagues and uh, with scientists from uh, SmithKline Beecham, the manufacturer of Avandia. Uh, those discussions were very helpful. Uh, couched with many caveats, in June of 1999, on two occasions I presented uh, this information, including, among many, many things, uh, this potential uh, signal of increased risk of cardiovascular disease. Subsequent to that, um, I received a phone call from an employee of Smith Klein Beecham uh, suggesting that it was uh, that people in the company were very upset, 
I explained to him that you know I had discussed it with people uh, in the company before. He mentioned uh, that there was a notion that the market capitalization of the company had decreased by approximately four billion dollars, um, and that the company there were people in the company that felt that I might be liable for that. Um, similar discussions were held with the chairman of my department, um, and uh, over the next uh, few days. Uh, I made an agreement to sign a statement to be used with the investment community to clarify some of my statements um, and offered to help with further analysis with regards to this problem. In March of 2000, uh, I was aware of ongoing discussions with the Food and Drug Administration regarding the safety of Regulin because I was concerned about uh, the safety of each of the agents for different reasons. Um, I wanted to make sure that the Food and Drug Administration was careful in considering withdrawing one agent when we didn't have robust safety data uh, with the other agents. And so I made the uh, FDA commissioner aware of the concerns that uh, I've just mentioned to you um, and called for greater enforcement of marketing regulations as well as additional trials. By their very nature, the observations I made in 1999 um, and uh, the more sophisticated analyses by Dr. Nissen are really uh, useful to generate questions, not to provide answers. Uh, and the most important question is today, what, what should patients and doctors do with regards to Avandia? Um, you know, I think the data are sufficient that uh, there is a, a reason for concern, but I think if a patient is very well controlled on Avandia, uh, with good col cholesterol uh, control, good blood pressure control, good diabetes control, um, that with the available data there might be greater risk to switching than to staying. But unfortunately, most patients with diabetes are not well controlled across the board. To be fair, there is no currently available drug for diabetes that's known to reduce cardiovascular risk. That said, there's certainly no diabetes drug that's marketed where we are aware of a signal to increase cardiovascular uh, events, except for possibly Avandia. If there is a lesson from the events of the last weeks and years, perhaps it's that upon filing a new drug application, pharmaceutical manufacturers should make every effort to develop adequately powered, independently executed studies that examine clinically meaningful endpoints, such as heart attack or loss of vision. In parallel with regulatory approval, such a study should be reviewed with attention to design, oversight, funding plan, and timeline, recognizing that such studies are very expensive and would take many, uh, many years to complete. Direct to consumer advertising and medical marketing should be constrained in such, until such studies are completed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Buse. Dr. Sadie? Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Bruce Pesady. I'm a professor of medicine and epidemiology at the University of Washington. I wrote the New England Journal editorials that accompanied Dr. Nissen's uh, meta-analysis and the GSK record study. I also served on the IOM Drug Safety Committee. This testimony reflects my professional views as a public health scientist. Could you pull the mic just a little closer? Sure. The crisis in confidence about the safety of medicines in America, which started with the withdrawal of rofecoxib in September of 2004, sadly still waits resolution. The loss of confidence has created an explosive atmosphere around drug safety issues. The problems raised by Avandia, the subject of the hearing today, point to the importance of several recommendations made by the IOM committee. The FDA needs leadership and authority to require sponsors to conduct high-quality post-market trials in a timely fashion. Public posting of clinical trial data was crucial to the identification of heart attack risk associated with Avandia. Direct-to-consumer advertising increases demand for drugs, some of which, like Avandia, may have been incompletely evaluated. The FDA needs additional resources, preferably from general revenues rather than PDUFA funds. Joint authority for regulatory actions in the post-market setting is also essential for the Office of Surveillance and Epidemiology. Decisions about safety matters need to be turned over in part or in whole to a new group with a more robust public health focus. Dr. Nissen conducted a meta-analysis, which is a method of summarizing previously conducted trials. In that analysis, Avandia was associated with a significant increase in the risk of heart attacks. And in other words, Avandia increases the risk by about as much as statin lipid-lowering drugs reduce the risk of heart attacks. 
The main limitations of Dr. Nissen's meta-analysis were the quantity and quality of the available data. The responsibility for the limited availability of high-quality data resides with GSK, which did not conduct studies to definitively address heart attack risk in a timely fashion. The regulatory history of Avandia includes several key missed opportunities. It was approved on the basis of the ability to lower blood glucose because high levels of blood glucose increase the risks of vascular disease. A glucose-lowering drug is presumed to reduce the risk of a heart attack. Paradoxically, Avandia appears to increase rather than decrease this risk. GSK did not make a serious effort to verify the presumed health benefits of Avandia in a timely fashion. The ADOPT and the DREAM trials focused largely on marketing questions and failed to address directly questions of heart attack risk or benefit. For drugs that will be used by millions of people for many years, it is essential to document the health risks and benefits of therapies approved on the basis of surrogate endpoints. If sponsors do not voluntarily initiate large long-term trials of public health importance, then the FDA needs the authority to insist that they do so in a timely fashion. In August 2006, GSK provided the FDA and the European Medicines Agency, the European equivalent of the FDA, with the results of several studies, including a meta-analysis similar to Dr. Nissen's. By October 2006, the product labels in Europe were revised to include this information. There was no uproar in Europe at this time when the labels were revised. The product label in the U.S. still does not identify heart attack risk as a potential adverse event in the general population of diabetics. It's not clear why the FDA failed to make this information public before Dr. Nissen's meta-analysis was published. The primary measure of regulatory success is the timeliness of, of information warnings and withdrawals. With Avandia, the FDA failed to warn or inform in a timely fashion. GSK's reg, uh, record study has several major limitations in design and conduct, and even if it continues to the planned conclusion, information about heart attack risk is, uh, is likely to be incomplete. Uh, last weekend, uh, after incorporating the uh, interim results of the record trial into the meta-analysis, Avandia is still associated with a 33% increase risk of heart attack. The possibility of heart attack benefit seems remote, and there is a statistically significant evidence of harm. Late and incomplete evaluations of health risks and benefits uh, of drugs such as Avandia create concern, confusion, and uncertainty among patients, physicians, and policymakers. The House of Representatives, which is about to take up drug safety legislation, has a unique opportunity to prevent future drug safety problems and to reinvigorate an essential regulatory agency that has many outstanding scientists. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sadie. I'll start the questions uh, of the three of you, and I appreciate your being here. Uh, Dr. Buse, I'd like to start with you because as far as I can determine, you were the first outside person outside of FDA to suggest that there be a post-marketing trial to determine the risk of heart attacks and stroke in patients that were taking Avandia. Specifically, you recommended that the FDA, quote, should encourage cardiovascular safety trials in high-risk populations, particularly with Avandia, where I believe there is ample cause for concern, and, and quote. And, and uh, without objection, I'd like to put the full text of your letter to the FDA dated March 15, 2000, in the record. Uh, you sent that letter to FDA. What response did you get from the FDA? Uh, I actually don't remember getting any specific response. I may have gotten a letter saying thank you for the letter, uh, but I, I don't remember, I certainly don't believe I was engaged in any specific discussion in this regard. I do run into people from the FDA from time to time and have had numerous conversations with them over the years, but nothing that specifically responded to my letter. Well, unfortunately, the FDA did not require Avandia's manufacturer to conduct the type of post-marketing trial you recommended, and here we are eight years later without that trial having been done so that we know uh, exactly what kind of risk people are taking. Why are we in this situation? Did you, um, uh, did, did, do you have any idea of uh, what went on in FDA? Dr. Von Eschenbach said that they asked for a study 
that would have included that, and that was the ADOPT and the um, DREAM studies. Did, did those studies give, you, give us the answers we needed to this issue? Um, no, as Dr. Nissen indicated, if anything, they suggested a trend towards risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, in fact, uh, the ADOPT study, I don't think adjudicated or very carefully looked at heart attacks. Um, I think it was more carefully looked at in DREAM, but both of those studies uh, were fairly low-risk people, not the high-risk cardiovascular patients where uh, my concerns were greatest. Uh, mm -hmm. And even the RECORD study uh, that Dr. Sadie mentioned uh, is a fairly low-risk, though higher risk than DREAM uh, and um, ADOPT. I, uh, I believe that part of the problem is that the FDA can't insist that a study be conducted. They can only request it. They can negotiate before the drug's approved that a study be done, but then if the company doesn't do the study, and in fact most of them don't do the studies they commit to, then the only course the FDA has as an option is to take the drug off the market, which would seem to me sometimes called a nuclear option because it deprives people of medicines that uh, they're using and they're relying on. Uh, Dr. Nissen, you did this meta-analysis. Uh, uh, you, you or your people informed us that you were doing such an analysis, but we didn't tell you to do it, and we didn't tell the New England Journal of Medicine to publish it, did we? No. Um, and uh, you didn't uh, get to see the manuscript until everybody else got to see it when it was published. Now, um, do you agree with Dr. Buse that it, it's going to be years before we get uh, the result of an appropriately powered cardiovascular outcomes study with Avandia? that's likely to provide an answer to the questions raised about, um, uh, raised in your study and yeah. the uh, questions I, that he's raised? I did, I did uh, get a look at the record interim results that were published uh, yesterday by the New England Journal of Medicine, and I agree with Dr. Buse that as currently designed, the record study is unlikely to give an answer even when it's completed in 2009. And since it's the major ongoing cardiovascular outcome study, I think the answer is that we will un be unlikely to have a definitive answer uh, even when it's completed in 2009. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sadie, how can we avoid this kind of problem in the future with drugs? It's going to take so long before a specific study can be actually done and give us the information we need. I think they can be started earlier and designed well. It's not clear to me whether the FDA didn't ask for the right study or whether the, uh, the uh, company didn't want to do it. And so I don't know what happened in those sorts of negotiations. But clearly there were concerns about cardiovascular events. Then they do a trial where they don't adjudicate cardiovascular events. And if you want to not find an answer, that's a way to do it. So we need the FDA, I, we, the FDA needs the authority to be able to determine the appropriate design and to insist that the companies conduct these studies in a timely fashion. I went through a, a number of time frames when the FDA had the, the signal that they ought to be looking at this issue, starting with their own reviewer who approved the drug, your, uh, Dr. Buse's letter, uh, others who are raising concerns. And it doesn't appear to me that until Dr. Nissen's uh, uh, a mega study was uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine, have we seen real action by the FDA on this matter? I hope we can avoid this kind of problem in the future. Do you want to? Yeah, uh, part something? of the problem is that the way things are set up now is we have, uh, we, the FDA does a terrific job evaluating drugs in the pre-approval setting. And then uh, they're approved, and then it's marketing. The, and it's partly um, the responsibility of Congress who set up PDUFA and prevented uh, FDA from using any of these funds for drug safety for the first 10 years. We need uh, additional attention to drug safety. It needs additional funding. Uh, and there needs to be a lot of work that takes place after the approval process. Thank you very much. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. Which, which one of you? Mr. McHenry. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, Dr. Nissen, uh, you outlined in your uh, testimony uh, a timeline of when you found when you started going through the whole process. At what point uh, did you begin your conversations with uh, Chairman Waxman and his staff? In February, I had uh, looked at the DREAM and the ADOPT study, but I didn't have enough information to actually answer the question scientifically. I wasn't aware that there was a website in the United Kingdom where GSK had disclosed the results of all their, their trials. So I really had 
an incomplete set of data. At the time, I was discussing with, uh, with various you know, members in various congressional committees the pending legislation around uh, the, the, the similar version of the Kennedy-Enzi bill on the House side. And so I mentioned to them that I had concerns about the cardiovascular safety of Avandia, and I actually requested their assistance in- So February? In February, requested their assistance in getting access to the data. I had essentially a scientific mystery. I didn't have the means to answer the question in a, in a robust scientific way, and I really was looking for help to be able to do that. I was looking to see whether they could use their uh, influence and authority. Did you to provide help your get, interim results? To no, well, to them? get to get access to any source of information, I was really inquiring: was there anything that the Congress could do? We well, had a, actually, I'm I'm, yeah. I'm going yeah. to another question. Okay. Did you provide your interim analysis? And re results well, I don't, to any member of the Hill or staff you know, on the I, Hill. I, the, there were no interim mm -hmm. results. I mean, basically, what we had what we had done is we had a very preliminary analysis, nothing formal. Did you provide your preliminary preliminary analysis? I did show to them a preliminary the analysis. That's correct. Yes. Okay. I At said, what here, point did you have that? Pardon? At what point did you have that, and did you share it with Mr. S Waxman's same, staff? Same time in February. February. Yeah. And so they were aware of what you were going through the process. They, of. they were aware that what I was working on. Yes. Uh, why? Why didn't you uh, discuss your preliminary analysis with uh, the Food and Drug Administration? Well, the Food and Drug Administration had all of these studies already. Remember that when you do a study, you submit a study report to the FDA. But you were actually submitting to uh, a medical journal uh, a new study with meta-analysis, which is. Uh, aggregating what was already public, and so you, you proffer your work as original, do you not? It is original. Okay, then why didn't you share that study with the Food and Drug Administration? After all, as members of Congress, um, we have a regulatory structure that we put in place for drug safety. Why didn't you go to the FDA this is with not, this analysis? This is not how, how it's done. We have to peer so review So going to Capitol Hill for a political purpose, to get publicity here in a hearing uh, is actually the way it's done. That's really medical uh, research. And with all due respect, sir, um, this the this is about patients. It's not about politics. If it's about patients, why would you not go to the regulator please, please, who please, has the authority and oversight please for let drug me, safety? Please let me finish. This is about patients, not politics. Um, I had an incomplete result. I was looking for assistance to complete the study. When it was completed, I did what any scientist would do. I sent that for peer review and for publication. Why? Because it is my scientific, is my ethical, and is my moral obligation to put such information into the public domain so that other physicians, other scientists, providers, and patients can consider our findings and making choices okay, about Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nissen. And uh, my additional question would be, what peers do you have on the oversight and government reform staff uh, for the Democrat staff? Because you shared your findings with them. Is that what you consider peer review? Is that what you consider pushing patients above politics? I did not give a copy of my manuscript to this committee or anybody else until it was published. Did you provide your initial analysis? I provided to them? a preliminary uh, suggest. I, I looked at the two Did trials. Did you provide a rough draft Pardon, of your? You, you're, you're interrupting me, sir. I really would love to be able to answer your questions. Um, I provided a preliminary analysis. I'd ask unanimous consent for two additional minutes so that this can go on appropriately. No, a uh, gentleman uh, has his time and he still has time left. Okay, then, then your let time me, is limited. Well, my time is limited and. Um, do, did the editors of the New England Journal of Medicine know that you shared uh, this analysis with members of the Hill before? I, I don't know what they knew and what they didn't know. I submitted the manuscript to them. So, okay, as a, a final moment here, because I know the chairman will wrap me down here, um, it, it seems very peculiar to me that if you're considering the patients first, that you would not go to the regulator who is overseeing drug safety, that you would go to Capitol Hill, which, as we know, is a political body, um, and we don't have the authority to take a drug off the market, the FDA does. So you can respond to that if you like, but my time is up, and I yield back the balance well, of my time. I, I would like to respond if I could. Um, the regulatory agency had all of the data that I had and much 
much more. So what I had was a, was a much more limited look at the data than what the FDA already had. It would make no sense for me to take study level data and submit it to the FDA when they already had the patient level data. So I would not have been giving them anything they hadn't had for many, many months. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Mr. Yarmuth is now recognized. And I would request of the gentleman to yield to me just for 30 seconds to yeah, ask the following to question. Mark, you, uh, you, came not to, you came to a number of committees, Democratic and Republican members on these committees. That's is that correct. true? And you asked for help to get data to complete your evaluation. Did you get any help from anybody on the no. Hill? And wasn't that the reason you came to uh, the committees of the Congress? A absolutely. Okay, thanks. Gentleman's right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to address an, a question to Dr. Buse and uh, understand that you have a very significant family event tonight, uh, uh, commencement, and you have to leave early, so I want to get this question. I congratulate you on that. Um, in your written testimony, you state that as far back as 1999, you had concerns about Avandia based on your analysis of the um, initial studies of, of approval studies and your knowledge that Avandia might increase levels of bad cholesterol. And you explained that you had discussed your concerns at a professional meeting in 1999, that after you did that, you came under a great deal of fire from, uh, or pressure from the manufacturer at the time, Smith Klein Beckham, which is now uh, Glaxo Smith Klein. And you said that community uh, company representatives complained to your department chair. Exactly what did they say to him? Um, so there was a high-ranking member of the uh, of the company um, that had a long-standing professional relationship before he joined the company with my chairman. Uh, and I don't know the details of the conversation, uh, but it was characterized to me as being disturbing. And the two phrases that I remember, uh, or three phrases, one involved that number four billion dollars. Uh, the second. Uh, was that um, I was characterized as a liar, and the third was that I was characterized as being for sale. What, was this something that uh, happened frequently in your capacity as a, a researcher? No, that was a fairly unique experience. Was um, the company in any position to exert any specific pressure on you or your chair or University of North Carolina? Were they funding research through UNC? I, I, I don't know the answer to that question at all. Right. Um, did, was there any evidence, so you, you mentioned the $4 billion figure as to a reduction of market capitalization. Was there any uh, re basis for that statement? Had the, the stock actually taken a hit? I didn't bother to look. Okay. Um, that would be a lot of money on a professor's salary, though, wouldn't it? That would take a while. <laughs> <laughs> You, you also testified that following those conversations uh, with your department chair that you signed a um, clarifying statement. Uh, was that statement something that you wrote or did the committee, uh, the company prepare that? Uh, the company prepared it. And during um, this committee's preparation, we requested documents from uh, GSK relating to their meetings and dealings with you. In response, they supplied a copy of a three and a half page fax you sent to uh, Dr. Yamada, the company's chairman of um, pharmaceutical research and development at the time. Do you recall writing uh, this letter? Uh, I recall agonizing about writing that letter. Um, I'd like to request unanimous consent that a copy of the letter be included in the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection, that'll be the order. And I'd also like to read an excerpt from the letter it says, I may disagree with SB's, that's Smith Klein Beckham's, interpretation of the data. I am not for sale. I am anxious to help in any way that I can to establish Avandia as a safe and effective anti diabetic agent with certain stipulations. I cannot change my opinions in the absence of new data or understanding, in large part because I am not for sale. I look forward to working with SB in the future, but will understand and not take offense if I do not. Please call off the dogs. I cannot remain civilized much longer under this kind of heat. Um, Dr. Buse, I regret that you were the subject of this type of intimidation. Um, I certainly hope it's not recurred since you sent that letter, and it goes without saying that this type of conduct is completely unacceptable. We can't have a post-regulatory, a post-market regulatory environment in which manufacturers attempt to 
uh, intimidate science. So I thank you for your testimony. I, if I could just add to that, I mean, I, I do think that most of the really ugly bits of that interaction were out of frustration, anger uh, of a limited number of individuals who felt that they were trying to be forthright in presenting the data with regards to their drug, and um, I, I, I have not had issues since then. That's, that's comforting. Thank you, Mr. Yarmouth. Yield back. Who's next? Uh, Mr. Cannon. I apologize. We have a uh, markup in energy, uh, the uh, on energy in the uh, Committee on uh, Natural Resources, and uh, so I've been back and forth. And I apologize for not having been here more. I note that you lose your entire status if you leave the uh, dais for a few minutes here. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I, I think you were here earlier when I was questioning uh, Dr. Von Eschen back, and and my concern in this process <coughs> is sensationalization. Um, I, I think Dr. Nissen. Uh, we probably agree that uh, the FDA can do things differently and better, uh, but uh, in this process, it's become, become I think, uh, well, at least sensational. Um, do you uh, buy stocks yourself, Dr. Neeson? I do not. Um, do you have friends that, that do? I'm sure I do, but I don't know what they own. We, we of course, that's not what we care about, really. What, what, are, are you familiar with what has happened to various drug stocks when they've been politicized over, say, the last eight or ten years? I, I, I really don't follow the stock market. Okay. Um, when uh, the Clintons uh, took over uh, the presidency and Mrs. Clinton did her uh, exercise in oversight of the uh, health care system, uh, she announced at one point that uh, the drug companies were the villains and that the, the administration was going to go after them. Do you have any idea what happened to the stock price of those companies? I don't. I don't. Oh, you have to. Pardon? It, you have to have it. Well, it didn't I, go I, up, I, of course. Well, I, you know, I don't. Stock prices I'm not fell. an expert on stock prices. Stock prices about half in that, in that period of time. And then about two weeks later, she came out and announced that the drug companies weren't really the problem and stock prices went up back to their normal state. A huge, multi-billion dollar uh, transition in, in, uh, in a market that we try to keep stable and we try and have it work for other reasons. Have you taken a look at or considered what has happened to uh, uh, Smith, uh, GlaxoSmithKline's stock? I have seen news articles to the, ex to the extent that the stock price has dropped. Do you know how much? I don't have specific figures. About uh, 20 percent. Little about that in that range, uh, over one study that is at least I don't think you you would say that the, that the study is definitive. There's certainly a whole bunch of questions that the study raises. Um, do you have a do you have a concern about the kind of sensationalism that that results in a 20 percent stock movement? You know, as a physician scientist, and first of all, I, I respect your, your perspective, uh, Mr. Cannon, but as a physician scientist, I have to ask the, the different sets of questions. And um, I did have concerns about publishing the study, and I did have concerns about how it would be interpreted. And so I, had three, I have three questions I have to ask before publishing a study. Is it scientifically sound? Did I use the right methods? Did I consider alternatives? And did I do a good job? And, and everybody agrees that you're very good at that, by the way. Thank you. But, yeah, but you know, I mean, you know, you, we can make mistakes. And so. Sure. And, and, that's, and, and so yeah. you, what, that's why we have a peer reviewed yeah. process. And that's to exactly those right. So, oh, know, I didn't think about that. Let's, let's yeah. go back. But in your case, in this case, it's probably not a mistake. I mean, in other words, you had studies that, were, that uh, GlaxoSmithKline had already done. Yeah. Their done, data was available online. Yeah. This is not anything that was being hidden by any means. Yes. And so uh, it's, it, it was a study of, of various studies, and a lot of assumptions were made in the process, and we came up with a signal. That's right. So the first question is scientific, and the second question is, is ethical and moral. Is it appropriate? And I knew that when we published this that, that it would, in fact, there would be concerns on the part of patients, that people would be potentially frightened. Mm -hmm. um, as a consequence, I tried to be as measured as I could in how I wrote the manuscript. And I really would encourage everybody to read what I well, said. I understand that. And yeah. I, apparently, I've missed some of the discussion here, but there's some question about whether or not you came to the committee 
majority staff and talk to them about this issue. I, I, what I told them earlier is that I did not share the manuscript. I did tell them I was working on it. I tell, told them I had concerns. But ultimately, what I wanted to have happen was we had to make a scientific judgment. We came to the judgment. I had to make an ethical and a moral judgment. And let me tell you that the, let me tell you what the alternative was. And it was an alternative I, I considered. The alternative would be not to publish, mm -hmm. to come to the conclusions and say, gee, this is so explosive that I just won't put it out there. And I did plenty of soul searching, and I realized that I had an absolute, absolute ethical and moral obligation Pardon to me, put Mr. my Nissen, findings. My, my time is almost gone. Can I just ask yeah. this? It, it, didn't the FDA have that obligation as an institution? And wouldn't it have been as well to have gone to them and talked to them well, about the, the issue? Well, the FDA, Mr. Cannon, I think has that responsibility, and I recognize that. that. The FDA, however, had the same data that I had. Right. And they actually had more data than I had, as I was explaining uh, a little bit earlier. They had all the patient level data. They had enough data to do a much more powerful analysis than I did. And, you know, the question obviously on the table here is, is where were they at in the process? And were they well, I, I think actually the it? question on the table is, here is why do we have this sensationalist hearing when everybody agrees that the data is indeterminate and you've got a really important drug and in the middle of all that you're whacking on a, on a business that is, that is doing its job to create a better there, world for there, people there who are is sick. A re there is a reason, sir, and, and the reason is that I wanted my colleagues who practice medicine and I want patients who take these drugs to be aware of our analysis. I thought that it was my obligation to inform them that there was a potential risk. I could not allow patients with diabetes. Mr. Chairman, I see my, my time has expired. I, if I can just make a comment. Well, the gentleman, gentleman's time ha has expired, and uh, we haven't really uh, allowed other members to extend their time, so I, I think I, I would dream of doing that. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Cannon. Uh, Mr. Cummings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, you know, I have a line of questioning, but I, I've got to say that um, after being here for 11 years, I hate it when um, witnesses are attacked. It bothers me, particularly when they're trying to do the best they can, in the words of Thurgood Marshall, with what they have. And I believe that you all are honorable men, simply trying to be the best that you can be. And so I'm going to ask one or two questions to clear this up. And I, I hate that we, we have to make, that these accusations are made that people are putting politics over the health of the American people. I, 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 that bothers me. So I, let me ask it this way. Dr. Buse and Dr. Sati, you've heard this line of questioning. You've heard what, what Dr. Neeson has said. Do you all have any issue with the professionalism uh, that he has, the way he has gone about doing what he has done to get this information published. Dr. Buse first. I have no issue with it at all, and, and I think he did a, a nice job of organizing the data and setting out that it was imperfect but important for people to, to be aware of. Dr. Sati. I agree. I think he did a terrific job in a difficult situation, and there were opportunities to prevent this. GSK could have published their meta-analysis. The FDA has had this information for months. Uh, it was released in Europe in October. I don't know why it takes so long for the FDA to, uh, to release information. I, you know, detailed analysis is important. But uh, at some point, it looks like a lack of transparency and a lack of communication. And it would have been perfectly reasonable in August to say we have two studies from GSK. They, uh, you know, they suggest this risk. It's not clear. They, they contradict each other. It's important for people to know this information. What Steve is dealing with is a safety issue, and it's prudent to warn patients about risks. We have to first do no harm. The thing that uh, that the reason why I did that is because you guys got to go home. You got to go back to where you came from. And I don't want national on national television for folk to believe that somebody is doing something that is improper if they're not doing that. 
let me ask you this. Um, let, let me say this. In my district in Baltimore, we have a high, high uh, degree of diabetes and heart disease. I represent Johns Hopkins, but today I guarantee you people will die today from diabetes and now I've learned something interesting that they will die from diabetes but probably the heart disease will kill them. And so today, would you recommend Dr. Neeson, based upon what you see right now, would you, if you were in, if your physicians came to you and said, should we be prescribing this drug? What would you say? I mean, just what would you say? If they said, look, doc, we just saw you on C-SPAN and, you know, we're kind of concerned about this. I deliberately did not answer that question in the manuscript or subsequently, and let me tell you why. With science, you have to allow individual physicians to make their own minds up about how to interpret the data. My job was to get the data into the public domain in the best journal possible, carefully reviewed and thoughtfully articulated. And what I've said is individual physicians should look at the results, discuss it with their patients, and make their own minds up about what the right thing to do is. We knew that wasn't the definitive end you know, we, we knew there was more questions to be asked, and rather than come to conclusions, we said, here it is, you decide. What kind of tests would you recommend that give us, would bring you to a conclusion where you would say yes or no? Yeah. What would need to be done is an adequately sized long-term trial, probably in fairly patients, comparing Avandia to other therapies. Um, that would, now unfortunately, because such a trial doesn't exist, it would not be completed for probably about another seven years. So it's a long, long way off. The problem was, as Dr. Sadie said, the time to have launched such a study would have been 1999 or 2000. So we're in a very tough quandary here in that we don't have the data to definitively answer the question. We just have the meta-analysis, which is all we're ever going to have because it looks like RECORD isn't going to give the answer either. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cummings. Uh, Mr. Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Nesson, I, I guess I'm going to keep following up uh, a little bit. One thing that was said in the previous panel, and it's unfortunate that the FDA you think so little of that you go to Congress before you go to uh, the, the scientists and the doctors who, who we entrust to make these decisions, uh, said, and they weren't willing to, to commit to the statistical likelihood of it, but you, you're somebody who reads some statistical likelihoods. You're responsible for this compilation of metadata. Why did you choose to ignore or to leave out metadata in which nobody died, in which nobody had a heart attack? Uh, and before you answer why you chose to leave it out, by definition, if you had put it in, wouldn't it have lowered the, conclu the conclusions that you reached? No, no, please, uh, Dr. Nesson. Yeah. Um, you can't calculate in a meta-analysis. You can't use trials in which there are no events. It simply can't be done statistically. And let me explain why. And I, I know you want a short answer, but it's Well, no, unfortunately, I, I insist on a short answer, so I'll, I'll re rephrase it to help make that happen. If you put zeros in statistically, yes, you would get a lower number. So now, the fact that you can't put it in, anyone with common sense says, well, these, these studies where nobody got sick were not something, or no, nobody had heart attacks. Those were studies in which the public and the doctors that you say you're providing this information to, even though you're providing, I mean, we might as well just have everyone do studies and every doctor evaluate it if we're not going to use the FDA. But the, in, the, in this case, you left that information out of what the doctors got to know, didn't you? That information cannot be used to calculate. No, no, no. I, my question was rephrased to make it a yes or no. You left that information out so the doctors did not have the knowledge that hundreds or thousands, whatever number of people were in all those studies, did not have heart attacks. You left that out, didn't you? That information is publicly available. No, no. On the GSK of website. your 
of your, of your report. They're relying on your report as part of the balancing act. You left it out, didn't you? Mr. Issa, you can't calculate an effect size when there are no events. Okay. The, I, look, the, we already did the, the statistics. The manuscript was, no, no. Re was sir, reviewed sir, by. Sir, I have limited time. You're not willing to answer the simple question of did you leave it out? Do, did, were the doctors aware of it? And to say the doctors can pour into research that you came to the majority staff and asked for help getting back in February as you planned to release this, this very, very uh, uh, earth-shattering uh, effect, whether you intended it to be or not, and I suspect you intended it to be, you came to Congress, you planned with them to, to, to essentially bring this out, you asked for additional information, and then you're going to come here, and I'm a little disappointed, and tell me that doctors can find it out themselves, it's public. I'm sorry, but leaving that out is the reason that you clearly should have gone to the FDA. And I'm going to ask you uh, a question related to that. Did you have discussions with the FDA back in January, February, or March when you were having discussions with the majority staff here? No. Okay. So you didn't go to the very body that we held here accountable that we're holding oversight hearings on, and, that, and yet we're going to ask them why they didn't do their job. You didn't even give them the benefit of the doubt. Did anyone from the majority staff suggest that you at least bounce these off of the FDA? That was never discussed. Did anyone here, as you were trying to get the, the, a political body to, uh, to get you more information, did anyone suggest that you ask the FDA to assist you? No. OK. So it very much looks like this was a political entity designed to, uh, to make a big public splash. It's clear from letters that I have here that, in fact, before your study was published, they were at, we were asked to ask for a hearing. Uh, so, in fact, didn't you make, reach a conclusion back in February that this was, in your opinion, a potentially dangerous drug and decide that you wanted to bring, shed light on it using this body and a public hearing and your article? Didn't you decide that all the way back, at least in February? I did not come to that conclusion until I would finished the meta-analysis. Okay, so what were you doing in February when you were saying you were concerned and asking for this information from a political body rather than, in fact, from the fundamental group that we hold accountable, the FDA? I had incomplete information. I didn't have all access to all 42 clinical trials. I knew that I and needed And you hadn't asked the FDA for it. You asked, well, the FDA, you asked, the FDA is not allowed to give the data out. How about the GSK? Did you ask them? I did. Okay. And did, the, and did uh, they give you the information? No. Well, we were unable to, to oh. reach agreement on the inf getting the information. When committee staff went, went with you with <clears throat> the, uh, the primary drug reviews uh, were raised, did they suggest that they could, in fact, get that information? Uh, and did you, uh, did you ask them to try to get it through, uh, through other channels? And I'm, did you wait for that before publishing? I'm sorry. I didn't hear your question. I didn't understand your question. When you met with committee staff, oh, when the committee staff, Oh, I'm sorry. When committee staff met with the FDA, uh, reviewers ra were raised <clears throat> the same concern. Uh, you said the, uh, the FDA included studies uh, with their metadata analysis that, uh, that you did not. W can you understand why they included the studies and you didn't? I, I don't, I, th my understanding is from what the, I've, they have not, in fact, announced what studies they've included, so I have no way of knowing how they did their analysis. Remember, their analysis has not been published or presented, so we have no way of comparing the two analyses. Gentlemen's okay. time has expired, but Dr. Sadie and Dr. Buse have been raising their hands to. Uh, Mr. You? Chairman, they can they can do what they want on somebody else's time. If you're going to take, if you're going to interrupt me during my time to ask a question, and then you're going to s bring it to a close, please don't. Please use somebody else's time to do this. I wish we had more time because this very much does, Mr. Chairman, as I said in my opening remarks, this does look like, in fact, this was a political concoction to, uh, to anecdotally go after a company rather than to do legitimate oversight on the FDA. Well, and, the gentleman and I, and I is, object to it. The gentleman is being demagogic. This is not anything that is political. Dr. Nissen's re paper was peer-reviewed and published in a very respectable journal. It is that article that has raised a lot of concern. It's certainly appropriate for this committee to, uh, to raise these issues and bring in the, state, the various parties to talk about the issue. Mr. And Chairman, I'm afraid you, that you are to uh, politicize this issue. Now, you asked a lot of questions, and two of the witnesses wanted to respond to your questions. Do you object to having them respond? I, I asked and did not get 
uh, answers from one individual who continually wanted to evade giving me the proper yes or no's that I deserved when I rephrased the question. So quite frankly, that's no, not my I, that's not my fault. You did the, you did what you could. He answered to the best. That's right, Mr. Chairman. And, and in regular order, I would appreciate that that uh, that we can have a second round, and certainly those can be asked uh, and answered uh, on either one of our times. And I and I would I would look forward to a second round if you think it's appropriate, Mr. Uh, chairman. Do you object to these two gentlemen responding? Mr. Chairman, to I'd ask for regular order. Well, let's go on to, uh, I think Mr. Shays' is, um, time, maybe, maybe he wants to be recognized. And, no, I, I, and I would be happy to, to let Mr. Issa pursue his questions. Okay, uh, Mr. But, Issa. But beforehand, I, I, I just want to, um, having come late to this, uh, Dr. Nissen, um, and I will uh, allow the two other gentlemen to respond to the questions that were asked, because I'd like to know the answers. Um, what I'm unclear about in just one area is, did you come to this committee because you wanted this committee to use its resources to get data for you? <coughs> That's correct. And did you feel that this committee had legislative ability to get this information that someone else didn't have the ability? You know, I'm not, uh, I didn't know what authority it had, but I had met the staff uh, because we had uh, discussed the, some pending legislation, so I said, look, um, I have a concern what, what here. What pending legislation was that? This is the, uh, the um, Waxman-Markey bill that's being considered, uh, on, on that's the safe. companion to, uh, yeah. to Kennedy Enzi. See, my, my problem is um, that sometimes I felt Congress has been used to go after companies uh, <laughs> and that the trial lawyers and everybody else uses the mechanism of Congress to then build a case and to be able to get information from the company uh, that you wouldn't have a right to unless you misused uh, Congress to do it. And that's where I start to become very defensive about the process. And, and I, I, I believe uh, that, that once people come before our committee, uh, my colleague on the other side of the aisle says he objects to how uh, witnesses are treated. I, I think it's just important. Once you, once you walk into this territory, you've got to be willing to, to have the scrutiny and to be able to respond to the questions. But I'd like the two other gentlemen well, to respond. Will the gentleman yield to, to me? Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. Uh, well, I don't know if you were here at the time, but Dr. Nissen came to uh, Senator Grassley's staff, our staff, Mr. Dingle's staff, others I, uh, that I might not be aware of, asked for help getting data, and he did not get the help for getting the data. He asked the company to give him the data. He did not eventually get that information. So that was the extent of our involvement. Right, right, thank you. I, I don't know if there's anything improper about it, but uh, yeah, but, but just I'd like the two gentlemen to give a response, yeah. then I would be happy to yield to themselves. Just very briefly in response to uh, Congress, Congressman Issa's questions uh, from Dr. Nissen, I've had the opportunity to speak with two statisticians in part of various duties I have regarding the analysis that Dr. Nissen did. And by the by the technique, he had to leave out those studies and he disclosed in the paper that I left out those studies because I have to, to be able to do this meta-analysis. And GlaxoSmithKline and the FDA have done their own analysis, best that they could do, and basically all the analyses come out with the same response, uh, the same result. So from my perspective, you know, we don't have to have a big discussion about what kind of analysis is done and whether it was done properly. Everybody gets the same result. Is, is your answer the same, sir? Uh, it, it, it is, but I think I can perhaps, may, I'm a biostatistically inclined epidemiologist, and if you think about it, if a study has no heart attacks, it can create, it can, it can add no information to a meta-analysis about heart attacks. This is not a, an, an effort to create uh, incidence rates, it's rate ratios, and they are not, uh, they are not affected by leaving out trials well, that the, have no information. To the non-scientific mind, if you do a study and there's not uh, an outcome that's negative, uh, it strikes me from a non-scientific mind that that's a, a certainly important data. Uh, the, the studies yeah. compare heart attack rates in one group to another, and if you have two groups and n there are no heart attacks, you have no information about heart attack risk. This is a standard approach. Other than they're not getting heart attacks. <laughs> With all due respect, let me, let me, let me yield to Mr. Eisen. It, but it's not an incidence rate that you're looking I, at. I understand there's something I don't get because I'm not right. a scientist, and I don't okay. mean that in a, in a way. You're just not going to be able to connect with me. Exactly. Logically, if people don't have heart attacks, that's data. Now, I, earlier we heard uh, that, that there was a study left out that had one heart attack, but they didn't die. 
So I guess if you don't die, you don't count either. I uh, think that was in the analysis of cardiovascular deaths. Okay. Well, the, uh, the FDA, in its reviews with our staff when we were preparing for this, said that by leaving out that data, you did bias the risk assessment. That clearly, if you take 1,000 people who all took the drug and you say 43 percent more likely to have a heart attack, that 43 percent is a relative number, and it can be expressed in a number of ways. So having said that, my concern here today is not whether or not this drug is more dangerous, because I think the science is still to be worked on on that, and I look forward to it being done. My concern here today, and, and the Chairman's calling it demagoguing, but it's part of the minority's job, is to second guess what's being simply handed to us. And what's being handed to us is you met with uh, uh, the, the various Democrat leadership, you prepared for uh, your paper in part in harmony with them, and doctor, you obviously did not intend to get peer review quietly, you intended to get it loudly, and you're getting it here today. I yield back. Uh, you didn't get peer review, Dr. Nissen, from uh, members of Congress, did you? Uh, no, they didn't see the manuscript. Okay. Well, that uh, completes the uh, questioning from members. I want to thank uh, the three of you for uh, your presentation here. I know, uh, Dr. Buse, that you were reluctant to participate in the hearing, so I especially appreciate your uh, participation. Ironically enough, if the FDA and, and, uh, and the drug manufacturer, GlaxoSmithKline, had listened to you seven years ago, we would have had a, a more definitive answer on a very important question that affects millions of Americans. We don't have the answer to it, although some members of Congress have answers as to how the scientific evaluation ought to be done statistically, uh, but most of us can't reach these conclusions. Uh, I just, uh, the conclusion I reach is that, uh, that we wasted a lot of time and uh, as a result of the information, the meta-analysis, we have an ongoing question that people have to grapple with, which is unfortunately not uh, resolved. I thank you very much and uh, appreciate your being here. Thank Do you. you. Have the last introduction. Do have the, our, our last uh, witnesses. Our last uh, witness is Monsef uh, Slawi, uh, a doctor. Uh, Dr. Slawi is the chairman of research and development of GlaxoSmithKline. Uh, Dr. Slawi has a Ph.D. in molecular biology and immunology in Belgium, completed the postdoctoral studies at Harvard Medical School and Tufts University School of Medicine. In his current position at GlaxoSmithKline, he has served on the research and development executive team and spearheaded recent changes to enhance drug discovery and accelerate product development. Uh, Dr. Slawi, we're pleased to welcome you to our hearing today. Uh, it's, as y you might have been aware from earlier witnesses, it's the practice of this committee to ask you to rise to take an oath. If you would, do you um, promise that to, uh, your testimony will be the truth and nothing but the truth? Thank you. The record will indicate you answered it affirmatively. We're pleased to have you, and I want to recognize you uh, for your oral presentation. Your full statement will be in the record in full. We'd like to ask you, if you would, to uh, try to uh, limit your presentation to uh, five minutes. There's a button on the base. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, thank you for having me, having me here today. My name is Monsef Slawi, and I'm the Chairman of Research and Development at GlaxoSmithKline, or GSK. I'm here to share with you GSK's extensive and ongoing efforts to research both the safety and the benefits of Avandia, an important medicine that helps patients fight the devastating effects of type 2 diabetes. GSK has initiated the most comprehensive research program for any oral antidiabetic medicines available to date, with experience in over 52,000 patients studied in clinical trials. By doing so, GSK has already undertaken what Congress has suggested all pharmaceutical companies should do, that is, rigorous scientific studies of a medicine's safety and benefit after it is approved by the FDA. The data we have collected from those studies not only confirmed Avandia's efficacy in controlling blood glucose levels in diabetes patients, but those data also showed that Avandia controls blood sugar for longer periods than other currently available oral antidiabetes medicine, 
Avandia has shown 30% and 60% superior efficacy to metformin and to sulfonylureas, the two most commonly used oral anti-diabetes medicines. As concerns the very important point of safety, the totality of the data we have generated over the last eight years establishes that when compared to other widely used oral anti-diabetes medicines, Avandia is not associated with an increased risk of death, including death from a cardiovascular event. The data also show that except for the well-described increased risk for congestive heart failure associated with this class of medicines, the TZDs, not just with Avandia, Avandia has a comparable cardiovascular safety profile to that of the most widely used oral antidiabetes medicine. Let me take you through this. From day one, GSK and regulatory agencies believed it was important to develop the highest level of scientific evidence to assess the cardiovascular benefit to risk profile of Avandia. Accordingly, in the year 2000 and again in the year 2001, we started two very large prospective long-term clinical trials, respectively the ADOPT and the RECORD studies. Both trials allow us to compare over a period of three to four years the safety of Avandia to that of the two most widely used oral anti-diabetes medicine, each in more than 4,000 diabetes patients. Specifically, the primary goal of the RECORD study was to compare the risk of cardiovascular deaths and cardiovascular hospitalization in these patients, including heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure in patients using Avandia or patients using other medicines. Importantly, given the length of these prospective clinical studies, we did not just stay there and relied on ADOPT and RECORD studies to come out. We proactively used other available scientific methodologies, albeit less robust than the prospective clinical trials. We just heard the discussions around meta-analysis to assess Avandia's cardiovascular safety profile. We ran our own meta-analysis in 2005 already, and also in 2006, which we knew would be useful for generating hypotheses, yes, but not for providing definitive answers. We also ran a very large real-world epidemiological study in over 33,000 diabetes patients. And that study showed that there was no increased risk for Avandia. While the meta-analysis conducted in 2005 and 2006 did suggest a potential increase in cardiovascular uh, uh, patients using Avandia, all other more robust scientific evidence that we have, and that's coming from four independent high-level scientific experimentation, three large trials, the ADOPT trial, the DREAM trial, the RECORD trial, and the large epidemiological study that I just spoke about. All those studies have shown that the hypothesis was not accurate, that there is an increase of cardiovascular risk associated with the use of Avandia when we compare it to the two most widely used oral diabetes medicines. Throughout this time, we also communicated diligently with the FDA. The data that we received from the meta-analysis, we transparently published the DREAM study and the ADOPT study in reputable journals, and we posted all our clinical trial results, as well as our meta-analysis on GSK's clinical trial registry, actually in October of 2006, well before the publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. We also diligently communicated to physicians and patients Avandia's scientifically established safety risks. In summary, at every step, GSK examined the questions generated by our meta-analysis and by that of others, and we determined that more robust scientific data consistently conflicted with the signals raised. The complete body of evidence available to date clearly supports our conviction that the cardiovascular safety of Avandia is comparable to that of the two most widely used oral anti-diabetes medicines. As we all work together here today on this issue, I do ask that we all remember that we are working on behalf of diabetic patients who are at risk of many, many, many major complications. They were cited, kidney failure, limb amputation, nerve injury, blindness, cardiovascular events, deaths. Unfortunately, the worldwide epidemic of type 2 diabetes shows no signs of abating. All medicines have risks, but the benefits of oral antidiabetic medicines like Avandia help millions of patients control their diabetes, 
and live healthier, more productive life. I must say that we find the record data that we published yesterday in the New England of, uh, Journal of Medicine very reassuring, recognizing that it is interim and therefore not fully conclusive. We are extremely disappointed by the editorials published yesterday in the New England Journal of Medicine that cherry pick data points when the data taken as a whole support the safety profile of Avandia. I thank you very much for your attention, and I will be happy to take your questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Slawi. I want to recognize Mr. Issa to start the questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to note that uh, I appreciate your being here today. Uh, the first panel was mutually agreed to as being the commissioner. That's common for administration uh, officials. Unfortunately, we had hoped to have you on the second panel uh, so that we could have the kind of interface that I'm afraid we're being denied right now. Uh, but be, I work with what we have. Uh, Dr. Nesson has been quoted as saying that uh, <clears throat> Avandia as a drug uh, has no established health benefits. Would you like to comment on that? Well, I completely disagree with that. I think that the scientific field has established in the 1990s very clearly that if you decrease the blood sugar levels over a period of time, you significantly decrease the risk of diabetes patients for what is called microvascular disease, which is blindness, amputation, renal failure, as well as cardiovascular disease. Every single oral anti-diabetes medicine that's today approved in the USA by the FDA, including two medicines approved last year, have been approved on those grounds. So uh, essentially, by definition, for the FDA to approve, your efficacy has already been established, and that is a, a really unfortunate statement since it flies in the very face of a, the approval process. Isn't that true? That is actually true, and I would like to add, uh, Congressman, that not only is Avandia effective, it's actually superior to the most widely used medicines. It's, as I said, 30 percent and 60 percent superior. Now, you know, I've been commenting on this being a political process, and, and I'm not going to back away from that because I, I think, unfortunately, uh, we're playing science here uh, when, in fact, we shouldn't be. Let me just ask you one question. Uh, how do you believe doctors and statisticians should handle meta-analysis results prior to receiving data from large clinical trials? And, and we don't want to alarm the public unnecess unnecessarily or needlessly. But we also don't want to sit uh, and let patients not have facts as soon as we have them. So how should this have, not only how should we do it in general, but how should this have been presented if you don't believe it was presented appropriately by uh, meeting with the, uh, the majority uh, folks behind closed doors and then, uh, uh, and then, in fact, publishing without dealing with your company or with the FDA? Congressman, I would like not to comment on exactly what Dr. Nissen has done. I'll, I'll tell you what I would have done, what actually GSK has done. In 2004, we knew that it was important for us to continuously look at the cardiovascular safety of Avandia. Actually, as of 1999, we have a very stringent pharmacovigilance system that looks at cases of cardiovascular deaths or cardiovascular uh, heart attacks, sure. et cetera, to assess whether there is an imbalance. We have not seen such imbalance. Yet there was some report in some patient population, combination with insulin that was cited earlier, that attracted our attention to myocardial infarcts. We immediately ran a meta-analysis ourselves. However, we knew exactly what we were dealing with. These are hypothesis generating technologies, methodologies. These are not facts establishing methodologies. So okay. we did that analysis and we immediately came with another scientific strategy, which was a real life epidemiological study on 33,000 patients. That has shown absolutely no increased risk. We communicated both information to the agency and I think we did the right things. Okay, well now, uh, GlaxoSmithKline, I, I don't want to get into the secret work you're doing, but uh, I'm assuming that uh, with TZE having a, a belief, we believe, a a side effect, in other words, that it can have secondary effects as a class, not your drug, but all the drugs. Wouldn't it be reasonable, and say yes if, if you can, that you're working on next generation that's going to reduce that, that either by changing the basic class of drug or by reducing the tendency of TZEs to, to have this potential side effect? Isn't that true? Congressman, ourselves as well as many other companies have and continue to work on second generations okay. of now, medicines. Now, there's, there's been a lot talked about about statistics, but if, in fact, 
this study was normalized for the fact that TZEs all have a certain higher uh, risk, at least anecdotally that's believed that, they're, that they tend to, that you get a good and maybe a little bad, if it had been reduced for that, wouldn't in fact the study have had different outputs? And, and, and I'm only asking for one reason. Isn't it true you could have sliced this statistics several different ways to get many much less alarming and yet equally accurate statistics? Congressman, meta-analyses are as good as the studies you put into them. The studies that we, the FDA and Dr. Nissen, have put into the meta-analysis, the raw materials, if you wish, on, on which the technology acts, were not designed to look at for cardiovascular events. You heard experts here talking about adjudication of cases. The cases were not adjudicated. So the starting material, the raw material, is not designed for the question that's being asked. The right way to ask the question, Congressman, are prospective controlled large studies. We have three of them. The three studies do, no sh do not show a significant increase in cardiovascular events. We think that's very clear evidence, and we seriously look forward to the discussion at the FDA Advisory Committee on the 30th to have, to have an in-depth scientific debate around this. I think the gentleman's that time has answer. expired. Uh, Mr. McHenry, I'll recognize you now. For I appreciate the chairman uh, uh, recognized me. And um, I've got a, uh, actually uh, one question to begin with. Um, I, I know uh, GSK was one of the first pharmaceutical companies, I believe the first pharmaceutical company, uh, to put the company's clinical, to actually publicly distribute uh, the clinical trial register. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, I know some other companies are now following suit, but can you describe what this means for patient safety and, and what this really means for public access? Congressman, it's actually very easy to access our clinical trial register. You just re need to remember the name of the company, GSK, and you put .com next to it. So I'm disappointed that some may have taken a long time to, to reach that information. When you get onto our uh, clinical trial register, you can click on the name of a medicine, and that takes you to every single clinical trial that has been completed, whether it was a positive outcome or a negative outcome. The trial is summarized there, and you can have all the information. I think what this means is full transparency. We do not withhold any information on a complete clinical study. Um, I also know that uh, we have disclaimers on all you know, there are disclaimers available for all prescription medicine. Um, and, you know, it, it describes specifically what the manufacturer uh, has found in, in the clinical trials and the research. Um, and uh, Avandia's, beginning in 99, uh, Avandia's label stated it was not indicated for patients with moderate or severe symptoms of heart failure. Now, that was out of what was derived uh, through your clinical trials. Is that not correct? That is correct, sir. Um, and that was uh, available to the FBA, FDA before they allowed a GSK to take it to the market. Is that correct? Absolutely. And discussed very clearly, and it was a known effect of a whole class of, uh, of medicines called the TZDs. Now, I, and I think a larger question here today is b beyond that. Um, um, you know, there are short-term studies and long-term studies. I know GSK is very involved through third-party sources, I, I believe. Uh, being a North Carolina company, I try to pay attention uh, to, to what Glaxo has been doing. Uh, but uh, the long-term study about uh, the, the, um, the effectiveness and uh, what, what medicines can do to uh, reduce diabetes. Uh, can you talk about some of the, the data and, and, and the difference between a long-term study and a short-term study? Yes. Uh, short-term studies uh, usually lasting about uh, six months uh, observation period usually allow you to have a very thorough and clear assessment of what has been called a surrogate marker here uh, uh, for the control of the level of blood glucose. Long-term studies allow you to look at somewhat more of the clinical events. Uh, diabetes is a very long-term chronic disease. It takes 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, as the expert had said earlier, for all the clinical outcomes to unfold. Running a study for 20 years is simply impractical, and those can be pop large population studies, not clinical trials. So we elected to run trials over a period of three or four years. And for instance, one trial was when you take a diabetes medicine, in fact, you're condemned to fail 
on your medicine because your diabetes evolves and all of a sudden your medicine doesn't work anymore. So we ran a trial where we saw, we asked, does Avandia allow diabetes patients to succeed controlling their glucose levels for a longer period of time than other medicines? And that's where Avandia was shown to be 30% or 60% better than the other medicine. We ran another study where people that are going to develop uh, diabetes uh, can be identified, and within a year or two, you will become a diabetic. When tested in those settings, Avandia was shown to prevent 60% the development of diabetes in such called uh, pre-diabetes patients. So Avandia has significant uh, public health impact and clinical advantages above and beyond the advantages of the other available oral anti-diabetes medicines. Uh, additionally, t talk about clinical trials, because it, that's something that GSK, I mean, you, you, you outsource to a third party for verification of, of your research, do you not? Yes. Actually, uh, when we run the large clinical study, we have what we call a steering committee of investigators who are totally independent from GSK, could be Dr. Nissen or Dr. Buse, who control the clinical study, control the communication around the clinical trial, and we also have what we call a, an independent drug safety monitoring board. This is a group of experts, again, physician scientists, who look at the safety of the patients in the clinical study. And if they see an imbalance in any event, they actually have the authority to stop the study. Every one of our studies has a, a DSMB. None of the, DDS, of the DSMBs who have all been informed of all the data we are discussing have decided or elected to stop or in any way, shape, or form impact the course of the studies. Thank you gentlemen, for the testimony. Gentlemen's time has expired. Uh, I want to ask you a few questions, if I might. Uh, Dr. Slawi, we are not here to make the, uh, uh, the, the scientific determination of whether Avandia makes patients healthier or whether it harms them. That is the job of the FDA. Uh, hopefully, the new data that you've generated will go to the FDA's um, advisory committee that's going to be convened to address this issue and, and help them. But what I'm interested in is why it took eight years after Avandia was approved for market uh, that doctors and their patients still don't have a clear answer. Now, uh, a major reason we don't have the data has been that there's no large, adequately designed post-marketing study of whether Avandia increases or reduces the risk of heart attack in patients with diabetes. Adopt, the study Adopt was a post-marketing study that your company conducted, and it was not designed to answer these questions. Uh, can you help us understand why, despite the recommendations of the FDA's medical reviewer, ADOPT was not designed to address the reviewer's concerns about deleterious long-term effects of the, on the heart. Certainly, Congressman. I think as, as the experts from the FDA have clearly explained to this committee, and I will clarify it further, a clinical trial, when we designed, addresses more than one question. The questions that the ADOPT study addressed were several, of which four, very specifically, were safety questions. At the time Avandia was approved, Hepatic failure was a very important concern. So it wasn't Secondly, a study just on heart disease. It involved other issues. And you That's can, what Dr. Van Eschenbach told us. You agree with that? Yes, and, Congressman. And as a result of that study, you, did you have enough information to tell you specifically on the heart attack question that there was no uh, additional risk? I will share with you the data, Congressman, because mm -hmm. everybody needs to hear them. This study had 4,400 and some patients included into it. There were 24 cases of heart attacks in the Avandia group and 20 cases in the metformin group, the control medication. These are four out of 4,400 patients treated with diabetes. This is a four individuals difference. The reason we conclude that this is not a demonstration, it's a statistical methodology. It's because the, the number of events is so small that we cannot conclude. Right. Let me so also instead, share with you another information, if I may. You know and you're aware we run a second study, the record study, where the primary endpoint were right. cardiovascular. Now, that wasn't requested by FDA. That was re requested by the Europeans, isn't it? Isn't that yes. accurate? Okay. Indeed. And that hasn't been completed. Yes. But I have 
great news for diabetes patients now, in I know the you USA. Have, I know you have some preliminary information, but let me ask you, because I only have limited time and we also have votes on the floor. You might have heard the bells. Um, in 2005 and then later in 2006, you did a meta-study. And of course, your meta-study uh, could be more complete than Dr. Nissen's because you had information that he didn't have. And as I understand it, as a result of your 2006 meta-study, you reported to the FDA, I mean, not you personally, but uh, um, the company, that there was a 31 percent increase risk of heart attack and that was statistically significant. Is that an accurate statement? That is accurate. And as you have heard from every expert, including Dr. Nissen, meta-analysis generate hypotheses. They do not provide answers. We immediately acted on that information. We took it extremely seriously. We run an epidemiological study on 33,000 patients. We analyzed the ADOPT and the DREAM studies. These are higher quality standard scientific uh, experimentation. When you can take a plane to Europe, you don't take a, a bus or you don't take a boat. Now, Dr. Meta analysis Nissen's, uh, is a boat. Uh, Dr. Nissen's study was peer reviewed. You didn't have to have yours peer reviewed. Um, would you be willing to make available to our committee the data and the information on the uh, meta? Meta studies that um, you did in 2006, Congressman, 2005. We would be, of course, very happy. Actually, for your information, this data has been available in full as of October 2006 on our website, okay. and Dr. Nissen knows it. Okay, that's that's very good. Uh, he had asked you for some information that would have made his analysis more complete. Did you ever give him that information? No, sir. But I I believe that this committee has a full report on our communication with Dr. Nissen. Uh, the information on your website is not patient-level data. Will you make that available to us? We will provide this to this committee if okay, you request. I appreciate it. Uh, I, I thank you very much for being here. I think your presentation was important for us to hear. We didn't uh, uh, have anybody request you to be on the second panel as opposed to the third panel. Our staff asked you or your representatives whether you minded being on the third panel or you wanted to be in the second panel. So. I just point that out because we, it's hard to keep up with these grievances that suddenly come up uh, in what I couldn't, I could, I, I hard, find hard to believe is a partisan uh, uh, oversight investigation. Uh, but uh, we, uh, we're trying to get the truth as, as all members uh, want uh, us to get. Uh, my time is up and I'm going to have to leave, but I do want to uh, point out that I think it was pretty shocking the way. Uh, uh, Dr. Buse was treated when he came in with his complaints. Did you, uh, did uh, SKG ever apologize to Dr. Buse? Uh, Dr. Buse had, uh, as he stated, made actually a, a mistake in a very balanced and good presentation that he gave in 1999. GSK, I think, appropriately requested that the mistake be corrected. There was a lot of passion, as Dr. Buse expressed at the time, on his side and on the side of the scientists that were involved but he, in this but he discussion. described intimidations. He was going to have to, he was going to have to personally pay the four billion dollar in drop in stock prices. That his university was going to be uh, uh, complained. Uh, the, the department was going to get complaints from the company. Uh, it sounded like real intimidation. Uh, you, you heard what he had to say, didn't you? I know the the person that Dr. Buse was referring to. That person was my boss for the last four years. I succeeded him in this role. Doctor who was, Dr. Buse? Dr. Tachi Yamada, oh, yes. uh, who is a world-renowned scientist and currently dedicating his life to uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to help children and patients in the developing world. He's passionate about his work. Mm -hmm. He dedicated his life to developing drugs. And as scientists, they had uh, quite a hefty debate. And I probably would not have done it the same way. We regret that Dr. Buse felt uh, pressure, absolutely. Thank you. Well, I, I appreciate your being here. Uh, your testimony concludes our hearing, so we stand adjourned. Thank you. Thank you very much.
On today's Washington Journal, Senator Mel Martinez of Florida joins us to talk about the immigration bill, which the Senate could finish this week.